The SCP Foundation does their best to live up to their famous namesake. They secure and contain anomalies and monsters from all around the world, or sometimes even off-world, and protect the public from the dangers that these strange entities might pose. However, despite their efforts to maintain security and keep their subjects under lock and key, there are sometimes creatures so clever, so devious, and so determined to escape their captivity and wreak havoc on the world that even the SCP Foundation struggles to keep them from getting free. One example is SCP-035, or the Possessive Mask. SCP-035 is one of the most dangerous test subjects in SCP Foundation custody, and its mere presence at the Foundation has resulted in untold damage, death, and destruction. It seems innocent enough to the untrained eye. The mask, which resembles a classic white porcelain comedy mask, though it occasionally changes its expression to tragedy, has been in existence since at least the 1800s. In the late 19th century, the Foundation discovered the mask in a sealed crypt beneath an abandoned home in Venice. It is unknown how it got there, or how the Foundation knew to look for it. If there was ever an explanation for its discovery, it has long since been removed or redacted from the Foundation's archives. You're probably wondering, how can a simple mask leave multiple seasoned Foundation employees dead? Well, like everything at the SCP Foundation, this mask is not what it seems. There is a reason its classification is Keter, a designation that refers to an entity that's excessively difficult to contain, and it couples this difficulty with a pronounced hostility towards human life, and the ability to cause widespread destruction in the event of a containment breach. These are the qualities that the poor unfortunate souls assigned to guard SCP-035 would come to understand all too well. The possessive mask is a parasitic entity, constantly seeking out a host willing to put it on. Any human being in the mask's proximity experiences a sudden, unexplainable urge to put it on, and once they do, there's no going back. SCP Foundation research has determined that once a host has put on the mask, their brain waves are replaced with an alternative pattern, this one coming from the mask, rendering the host effectively brain dead. Once the host's brain function has been eliminated, the mask takes over, piloting their body and even speaking through them. However, the mask can only occupy a host for a small amount of time before the body begins to decay and decompose, eventually rotting away completely, leaving nothing but desiccated flesh and bones where there once was a person. SCP-035 is capable of possessing any humanoid being, whether that's an actual human being or a lifeless humanoid shape. Despite all their research, the SCP Foundation unknowingly gave the mask all the tools and resources it needed to break containment and leave a trail of bodies in its wake. For a time, the mask was given host privileges, meaning that it was purposely allowed to occupy a host in order to speak with the scientists studying it. In order to avoid murky ethical issues, the host was usually something inanimate like a mannequin or a statue. These conditions, however unsettling, allowed the researchers to carry out interviews with the consciousness housed inside the mask, in the hope of beginning to understand it and its motivations. However, SCP-035 lost all access to its host privileges after it almost pulled off an unprecedented, shocking, and nearly catastrophic escape attempt. In its early days at the facility, when it was still allowed host privileges, it was contained in a triple locked room and monitored by several research personnel. These were experienced researchers who had been with the Foundation for a minimum of five years each, an unusually long tenure in such a dangerous and mentally corrosive line of work. These research staff members were thought to be the most capable of handling interactions with the mask and be able to resist its attempts at manipulation. Unfortunately, these assumptions were naive and seriously underestimated the mask's power. Research on the mask indicates that the mask is incredibly intelligent and a skilled manipulator. It has a photographic memory, intelligence that would rank it in the 99th percentile of humans, and the ability to incite dramatic changes in the behavior and people that it talks to. One particularly infamous interview between the entity and an unnamed doctor at the Foundation suggested that the mask may even possess telepathic abilities. The mask was able to give details about the doctor's life that no one else was privy to, including knowledge of an affair that his wife was having. Following the interview, the doctor suffered a psychotic break and committed suicide just 24 hours later. The mask is able to use its superior intelligence, charismatic personality, and mind-reading abilities to get inside the heads of those it speaks with. It will pull out any and all psychological stops to get what it wants, 
leaving broken minds and spirits in its wake. It was really only a matter of time before it used this skill set to its advantage and attempted to escape its confinement. The day of the escape attempt was like any other. The research staff, a team of three intelligent, experienced men, checked into the facility, measured the conditions of the mask's containment unit, and began the process of interviewing the mask like normal. Its motions were slow and looked to require great effort, as its current host was beginning to degrade beyond use. The mask was attached to the blank face of a mannequin, and corrosive black liquid could be seen oozing from its eye and mouth holes. This liquid is excreted by the mask at a near constant rate, and it's thought to be at least partially responsible for the accelerated decay of the host bodies. In spite of the entity's unsettling, nightmarish appearance, it was just another day's work for the men assigned to monitor SCP-035. And so they carried on with their daily routine. Everything was going according to plan until one of the men, Dr. Jones, began to behave erratically. He demanded that his fellow scientists leave him alone with the mask for a while and allow him to engage in a private conversation with it. It is unknown what exactly the two spoke about while the other two scientists were absent, as the security footage mm. captured had no sound. However, several minutes into the conversation and the footage, Dr. Jones can be seen dissolving into a fit of tears, laying on the ground and shaking with sobs as the mask dispassionately watches. He then climbs onto his knees, begging the mask for something, before he embraces it. He holds the mannequin in his arms for five straight minutes, weeping again before they separate. After this disturbing emotional display, Dr. Jones brought the other scientists back into the room with him. What happened next is still uncertain, but there are a few things that we know for sure. The other scientists began to speak with the mask. In later interviews, the other scientists were bordering on incoherent babbling about various traumas from their lives. One repeatedly referred to a drunk driving accident where a dear friend was killed and he was at fault. Another simply cried out for his mother again and again. Whatever the mask said to them, it was enough to completely destroy their mental health. After the two scientists had been emotionally devastated by the mask, Dr. Jones escalated the situation further. Dr. Jones removed the mask from the decaying mannequin body and, shocking everyone who had later reviewed the security footage, placed it onto his own face. Once the mask was in place, the security footage ends. At the command of the mask, which was now speaking through Dr. Jones, the other two men switched off all security camera monitoring oh. SCP-035's containment facility. The mask, piloting the body of Dr. Jones like a horrible fleshy puppet, made its way through the facility, avoiding detection until it reached the exit doors, where it was finally stopped by a team of over a dozen security guards. Knowing the dangers of touching the mask, all Foundation employees involved in the recontainment of SCP-035 refused to remove it from Dr. Jones' face. Instead, he was placed in the lock room with the mask still on, left alone to be observed over the security cameras until his body had decomposed beyond use. His body paced back and forth in the cell for days, flesh rotting and dropping away only until sinew and bone remained. Only when the bones began to turn black and brittle, crumbling apart into dust, did the body finally stop moving. His family was notified, the mask was carefully removed from what was left of his body, and his remains were destroyed. The other two scientists involved in the SCP-035 escape attempt were terminated and their files destroyed. After this incident, a few more failed escape attempts and the acknowledgement of the devastation that could have been caused if the mask had made its way out into the general population, SCP-035 lost its host privileges altogether. Several research staff protested this decision, insisting that there was more to be learned from speaking with the entity, and citing valuable information that it had given about other SCPs. However, the risk was determined to considerably outweigh the potential reward, and the request to reinstate 035's host privileges were denied. Several staff members went so far as to erupt into violent outbursts on 035's behalf, attacking their supervisors who refused to provide the mask with a new host, clawing at them with animalistic rage. Any staff members that submitted a request to reinstate said privileges were considered a security threat and reassigned to a different SCP, or in some cases, terminated. Any staff member who had direct contact with SCP-035 was also terminated, in order to avoid the risk of any more staff-aided escape attempts. The mask is now kept in a hermetically sealed glass case, and there is a psychologist on call to provide assistance to anyone guarding it in case of adverse effects on their mental health from the mask's presence. Personnel that work around the mask, 
even in its current dormant state, experience frequent violent outbursts and a higher rate of suicide. Even without a host, the mask's corrosive effects have spread across its containment facility. The walls of the room have begun to secrete the same black liquid that emanates from the mask, which tests have revealed to be highly contaminated human blood that damages the structural integrity of the walls following prolonged contact. This blood has begun to form patterns on the walls, spelling out words and phrases in Italian, Latin, Greek, and Sanskrit, as well as depicting drawings of ritual sacrifice and mutilation. Staff members also report hearing unintelligible whispering and horrifying high-pitched laughter when in proximity to the mask. Further exposure to the mask results in migraines, hemorrhaging around the eyes, mouth, and nose, and an eventual psychotic brain. Between the corrosive substance appearing on the walls and the physical and psychological damage to employees, SCP-035 is becoming increasingly difficult to contain, and there are debates among staff as to whether the entity can, in fact, be contained at all. As soon as possible, SCP-035 will be moved into a new containment uh -huh. facility, and its previous cell will be isolated from the rest of the Foundation's property and destroyed for the safety of all involved. We can only hope that the new containment procedures are more effective than the last ones, and that this mask never makes its way into the world again. If it does, who knows how many lives it will claim. In the meantime, if you ever come across a strange mask and feel a nearly uncontrollable urge to put it on, ignore the whispered pleas to just try it. Ignore the echoing laughter and the sensation of something older and more powerful than you can imagine rummaging through your deepest, darkest secret thoughts. Turn around and run as fast as you can in the other direction. You'll be glad that you did. The desert is still. The night seems endless, silent, and at peace, until it's pierced by the sound of gunshots and screams. Deep in the Sahara, the SCP Foundation is waging war against a newly discovered enemy. A squad of Foundation agents is retreating, trying to get away from the ones who massacred their allies. They were attempting to eliminate the threat using conventional means, but their rifles were no match for the reality-bending entities of the Kingdom of Abaddon. The retreating agents cover one another as they make their way back to the extraction point. The enemy force advances. Agents that are caught too close to the sorcerers of Abaddon disintegrate into thin air. This is not an enemy they can defeat. The SCP agents need to get back to base and relay what they have found to their superiors. Out of the hundreds of agents sent into the Sahara that night, only a handful make it out alive. They are debriefed by their superiors at the Foundation who classify the anomalous humanoids under the highest of threat levels. The Kingdom of Abaddon is a threat. The Kingdom of Abaddon must be eliminated. Reconnaissance done prior to the disastrous mission had alerted the Foundation to the presence of anomalies in the region, but they had no idea how strong the anomalous humanoids would be. From data gathered through old reports, it seemed like the Abaddon humanoids were responsible for the deaths of no fewer than 75 Foundation personnel, and had stolen at least 12 different items from the Foundation. The leaders of the SCP Foundation tasked Research Team Omega-5 with developing a weapon that would be capable of destroying the Kingdom of Abaddon once and for all. The weapon they are researching must be capable of long-range destruction, because the moment any Foundation agent gets close to the area, they are vaporized by the reality-manipulating powers of its inhabitants. The project is given the name Twins of God, and is led by a Foundation doctor known only by the designation O51. O51 is popular in the SCP Foundation, well known for his in-depth research and charismatic personality, making him the perfect person to lead such a project. And O51 recently came across an anomaly that he believes holds the solution the Foundation has been looking for to defeat the Kingdom of Abaddon. Item 001. And so the Omega-5 team gets to work. They discover that the anomaly has incredible powers when put inside a host, which they refer to as an Item 001 entity, and set up a series of experiments using different people to harness its energy. The first series of tests all end in tragedy. The anomaly causes the entity it inhabits to become intensely radioactive. Anyone who gets close to it succumbs to immediate radiation sickness, and eventually, death. To stop the radiation problems, the Omega-5 research group intensifies the containment procedures. O-51 receives reports from the higher-ups that the Kingdom of Abaddon has attacked another Foundation facility in Sudan. Long-range defense is needed ASAP. The administrator puts more pressure on Omega-5, 
and especially its leader 051 to solve the problems of item 001 and develop a weapon that can save the Foundation. He stays awake for days on end, working tirelessly to create a safe and controllable Item 001 entity. Although there are signs that the weapon will work, it is still unpredictable. <gasps> when Item 001 is initiated, the host entity becomes paralyzed, suffers severe cerebral hemorrhaging, and soon a new host is needed before testing can begin again. And that's not the only thing that goes wrong. Whenever the anomaly is put into a new host, sudden and random destruction of on-site structures and personnel take place. O51 knows, though, that if this power can be harnessed and controlled in the right way, that it could be the weapon that the Foundation needs to wipe out the Kingdom of Abaddon once and for all. In order to control Item 001, O51 has a mind kill switch implanted in its host's brains. O51 can activate the implant to incapacitate its host and immediately stop the unwanted destruction. Countless hosts are terminated by this mind kill switch in the early trials conducted by the Omega-5 team, but progress continues to be made, and eventually a hypothesis is formulated. Perhaps the disastrous side effects of item 001 can be offset by spreading the anomaly across multiple subjects. They theorize that the immense mental load of the anomaly can be distributed among several hosts, thus reducing the toil it takes on each and giving them the ability to control its immense power. But 051 and the Omega-5 team need more data. And for that, they need more bodies. They consult with the director of Site-17, and it is concluded that the nearby town of San Marco would be an appropriate place to get the additional test subjects they require. On a quiet Sunday morning, Omega-5, along with support from a squad of armed SCP agents, storm into the San Marcos de la Vida Sterna Church during the middle of Mass. They gather up a number of the younger congregants and bring them back to the site where Item 001 is housed. The researchers quickly ran through their new supply of test subjects, though, and Omega-5 would need to get even more if their research was to continue. Instead of going back and forth between the testing facility and San Marcos, O51 decided to move the entire Item 001 operation to the town itself. He renames the town Testing Site 001, and Omega-5 rounds up 23 of the healthiest subjects they can find for use in the next series of research yeah. tests. A few weeks after occupying the town of San Marco, Omega-5 makes its most substantial progress yet. Just as they theorized, by spreading out the anomaly of Item 001 across a specific group of hosts, they can control its powers. The test may have cost the lives of almost everyone in the town, but the ends certainly justify the means. The Kingdom of Abaddon poses an existential threat to the SCP Foundation, after all, and thanks to this research, they will soon have a weapon capable of bringing them victory. The Foundation Administer criticized O51's methods, but can't argue with his results. Unfortunately, O51 has a dark secret, a secret that disturbs even the most hardened and loyal members of Omega-5 a secret that has to do with the Item 001 hosts. The hosts that Omega-5 has made its major progress with are not the ordinary test subjects normally used by the Foundation. No, the test subjects O51 makes his breakthrough with are children, nine of them to be exact, all between four and 11 years old. Despite being told specifically by the Foundation Administrator to only test on adults, the research required O51 to break the chain of command and follow the science down the path it led. The children are contained in a reinforced bunker where only O51 and a select few have access. They are technically alive, but are functionally brain dead. The group of nine children share a hive mind that can process information, and more importantly, can unleash the full potential of the implanted anomaly, creating and controlling a devastating power but not everyone is thrilled with what they've achieved. Members of Omega-5 are haunted by the screams of the children that they forced to be part of their weapons development program. They describe their merging with Item 001 as being a process that rips out their souls and replaces them with something much more sinister. In fact, all of Omega-5 regret what they have been a part of and what they've done, all except 051.
The nine children can channel unprecedented amounts of energy from an unknown origin that Omega-5 hypothesizes comes from an extra-dimensional source, which is then used to unbind atoms at the quantum level. When the right activation words are spoken, it appears as though this tremendous power gives the children the ability to annihilate anything in the entire universe. It's a gun to end all guns, and only O51 has the key to control it. The Nine Children works so well with an item 001 that Omega-5 reclassifies it to include the Nine Children themselves. They are not just the entity housing or controlling item 001, they permanently become item 001. Once Omega-5 has a better understanding of item 001, they begin to run tests to find out the full extent of its abilities. First, they test the distance item 001 can reach. The initial test that Omega-5 carries out is on a steel rod placed 5 kilometers away. 051 orders the children to destroy the target. Moments later, the phone next to 051 begins to ring. When he picks it up, the observer tasked with watching the pole is on the other end. He informs 051 that the steel rod has been completely vaporized. 051 is not satisfied though. He has another pole sent out, this time placed 8,000 kilometers away from the nine children. 051 asks the children to destroy that rod. Almost immediately, the phone rings again. The target has been vaporized. 051 smiles. The next series of tests Omega-5 runs on item 001 are to determine the maximum size of an object that can be destroyed. The tests start out with a steel sphere, 3 meters in diameter, placed 1,000 kilometers from item 001. 051 orders the children to destroy the object. It is instantly vaporized. 051 has seen enough small tests. It's time for something big. So he does something that will later be questioned by everyone at the SCP Foundation. He orders the nine children to destroy a Church of the Broken God worship site in Turkey. Not long after the destruction order is given to item 001, reports begin coming in. The worship site has been obliterated with no observable damage to the surrounding area. Deadly and precise. 051 closes his eyes and takes a deep breath. He looks as if he's overcome by an immense spiritual experience. He opens his eyes, leans over to the children, and whispers the name of someone. Later that day, 051 finds out that the target he had named has been vaporized. The success of Omega-5 in Item 001 is relayed to the administration of the Foundation. They are so impressed that they make plans to use Item 001 to eliminate the Abaddon threat once and for all. However, one of the heads of the Foundation, Administrator Williams, has major concerns about the way 051 is running the program. The updates that 051 has been sending have become less scientific and more philosophical, more spiritual. Administrator Williams sends a letter to 051 reassuring him that he is doing good work. But once the mission to destroy the Kingdom of Abaddon is completed, 051 will be promoted to director and reassigned to the newly constructed Site-19. For the good of the Foundation, and maybe the rest of the world, he'll be permanently moved away from Item 001. 051's response is short and to the point. I am fine, Administrator. The project is finished. We will complete our task when you arrive. Administrator Williams arrives at Site 001 a few days later. He is greeted by 051 and the Omega-5 team. Williams can't help but notice that 051 has a strange look in his eyes. It is the look of a crazed man who has been lost in his work and who has, perhaps, lost himself. Williams puts the thought away, though, and walks with 051 and his accompanying agents to the viewing area where the powers of Item 001 will be demonstrated. Administrator Williams and the other agents watch from a protected viewing room as 051 enters the chamber of his new superweapon. It's time to see if their weapon that has had so much time, effort, sweat, tears, and especially blood poured into it will have been worth it. Everyone watches as 051 leans over and says the name of the Abaddon Citadel to the nine children. All at once, they start to glow. No one observing can see what has happened in the far-off kingdom, but they know something big has happened. The administrator is thrilled, but notices something. 051 hesitated a moment while leaning over the children before standing back up. Did he whisper something else to them? And then Administrator Williams vaporizes, pulled apart at an atomic level before he has the chance to scream. 
What's going on? The agents standing next to where Administrator Williams previously existed begin to yell and pull out their guns. They burst through the door of the observation room and run down the hallway towards where 051 and the nine children are located. The armed agents rush into the room, but 051 is gone. The nine children are still. Over the next few weeks, 051 is reported to be seen several times by SCP agents. However, no one is able to catch him, and it appears as though other members of the SCP Foundation have also gone AWOL as well, perhaps joining him on the run. It is unclear what his plan is, but the reports from the reconnaissance team sent into the Sahara make it obvious what the result of his first command to the children was. There isn't a single humanoid or building left in the Kingdom of Abaddon. But even with this victory, the highest levels of the SCP Foundation have an ominous thought lurking in the back of their minds. Where did 051 go? And what is he planning to do next? Following the improper use of item 001 leading to the untimely death of a high-ranking Foundation staff member, the weapon was deemed too dangerous and containment procedures were implemented. Due to the high amount of radiation they were found to emit, the nine children were placed into lead-lined bags and buried under 50 meters of concrete beneath the church of San Marcos de la Vida Eterna. Though all of the children continued to be functionally brain-dead, they still display signs of life despite their containment, and by order of the Overseer Council, have been classified as a thaumiel entity. It's a natural instinct in many species to protect their young, and sometimes it's not just their own babies, but any young that look like them. Regardless of your personal feelings on humans' earliest stage, it is a scientific fact that human babies are designed to emphasize their own adorable helplessness to make sure that other, older humans take care of them. A baby's cry is an inherently distressing sound, and when we hear it, some deep primal part of us feels the urge to comfort and care for the child until the sound stops. But of course, we're talking about the world of the SCP Foundation here, where there are bunnies that can eat anything, teddy bears that might steal your organs to make duplicates of themselves, and chocolate fountains filled with trillions of murderous insects. Nothing is what it seems here, and even the most innocent and cute creatures may be hiding a deadly secret. SCP-734 being no exception. Today we're talking about the baby. This anomaly proves that dangerous things can come in small packages, but where others only saw misery and death, the SCP Foundation saw a certain potential. Our story begins in the maternity ward of a hospital in the USA, where every medical professional's worst nightmare was unfolding. An unknown but incredibly fast-acting, flesh-eating pathogen seemed to be running rampant across the hospital's population. It began when patients who weren't even admitted for dermatological issues started complaining of severe itches and extreme skin pain. Some nurses and doctors in the maternity ward began to experience similar symptoms, as well as one of the infants, leading to a massive quarantine effort. While the initial symptoms first appeared to be limited to severe pain and discomfort on isolated parts of the skin, the condition of the afflicted soon escalated. Their skin began to messily flake off as the cells comprising it lost physical cohesion and died. It was a kind of strange, anomalous rot that seemed to work inwards, first destroying the integrity of the outer layer of skin, and then caused further disintegration to deeper parts of the body. Once the skin had shut off, the pathogen would turn its attention to what was lying beneath. Against all odds, the disease affected organs, muscle tissue, the vascular system, and even bones. Nothing was spared. The victims' bodies would completely break down, and they would be dead within a few hours. By the time the pathogen had finished ravaging its victims, what was left didn't even look human anymore. Not only patients, but doctors and nurses that had been walking the wards mere hours before were now little more than piles of human tissue sitting in what had previously been their hospital beds. Whatever this was, it seemed like the fastest progressing infection in recorded history. Hospital staff and administrators were terrified. This appeared to be an entirely new disease, with a mysterious form of transmission and, worst of all, no cure. They were even more confused when several black vans pulled up outside the hospital and mysterious men in hazmat suits spilled out and began setting up a quarantine zone around the entire building. Whoever these strange people were, they definitely weren't the CDC, 
Little did the hospital personnel know that this was the group you'd never want showing up and putting your location on lockdown. It was the SCP Foundation. The infected remains of the victims were taken away for research purposes, and the Foundation operatives immediately began conducting debriefing interviews with witnesses. They soon determined from a mix of eyewitness accounts and hospital surveillance footage that everyone infected with the mysterious pathogen had all been in a particular section of the maternity ward earlier in the day. And when the operatives investigated this area, they found another strange detail. An infant had no registered mother present in the hospital. The Foundation would later learn that this was likely because the baby's mother was the first victim of the deadly disease. After eliminating all other possible options, it seemed that the only anomalous element that could have caused all of this was the mysterious baby. Though just how the mother even survived carrying the baby to term was a mystery in and of itself. The baby was a Caucasian male human infant between seven and eight months of age. Nothing appeared outwardly anomalous about the child, but they could confirm that every single victim of the anomalous pathogen had come into physical contact with the child earlier that day. Everyone who had been at the hospital was given amnestic treatment, and the Foundation constructed plausible cover stories for the deaths that had occurred that day. Like so many others before it, the child was secured and spirited away to the nearest applicable Foundation containment site. There it was reclassified SCP-734. And finally, the real testing into what precisely this infant was capable of could begin. Physiologically, SCP-734 appeared mostly non-anomalous. The infant had above-average intelligence and physical aptitude for a child his age but otherwise showed no mutations or abnormalities that would suggest a divergence from typical human biology. Despite a vast array of tests performed by the Foundation into essentially every aspect of 734's biology, they couldn't find anything that hinted at the origin of the mysterious pathogen. But through some trial and extremely costly error, the Foundation was able to learn more about how exactly the pathogen worked. The only vector for transmission seemed to be direct contact with the baby itself, up to and including the fluids and residues it leaves behind. Those affected cannot transmit the anomalous flaking effect to others, meaning the risk of an epidemic is relievingly minimal. But of course, accidents still happen, as was discovered when one agent misplaced her sympathy for the baby and decided to remove her mask while interacting with him. Her logic was that her masked face might have caused the baby some kind of distress, and as long as she was only coming into contact with him via her own gloved hands, everything would be fine. But some dust particles were floating in the air at the time, and SCP-734 sneezed in her face. The agent began screaming in pain and recoiling from the baby, but it was already too late. Her fate was sealed. She was taken to the infirmary and given sedatives so that she could hopefully die in as little pain as possible. In roughly 72% of cases, amputation of the affected areas has prevented the entire body from succumbing to the anomalous effects of SCP-734. But this isn't exactly feasible, where the point of contact is the victim's head. Within hours, the agent's flesh had flaked off her face, leaving her looking like a red, bloody skull. A few hours after that, she didn't have a head at all. Throughout the disintegration process of this unfortunate agent, the Foundation took grisly photographs. These photographs are shown to anyone preparing to work on the SCP-734 research project to teach them a hard lesson on the importance of adhering to proper safety protocols. And these protocols about how to deal with the baby are incredibly tight, given that even incidental contact is often a death sentence. Anyone entering the baby's containment chamber needs to wear contained atmosphere hazmat suits. Anyone who makes physical contact with the baby, even when suited up, is immediately removed from the area and subject to several hours of quarantine and observation. Even inanimate objects that have been inside the containment chamber need to be thoroughly sterilized before being removed. Given that even anomalous children like SCP-734 have very delicate needs, a handler is always standing by in full hazmat gear to take care of the baby. These handlers are rotated every hour to maintain alertness and safety. These handlers feed and change SCP-734 regularly, 
and sometimes even provide toys that have been approved by the O5 Council. The Foundation has gone to great lengths to keep SCP-734 alive and comfortable because they believe that SCP-734 could be an important asset for them in the future. Or more specifically, they see great strategic value in SCP-734's blood. As mentioned earlier, contact with any matter from SCP-734 triggers its deadly anomalous effects, including bodily fluids like blood. But unlike many toxic pathogens, in this case, there is no risk of the infection getting out of control, since the infected do not become vectors for transmission. Because of this, the blood of SCP-734 can act as a powerful weapon for both terminating anomalies deemed unviable by the O5 Council and assassinating dangerous people who belong to rival groups. Contact with the blood would completely destroy the target's body, with no other anomalous effects and no evidence of who exactly conducted the hit. SCP-734 has been fitted with an arterial catheter so that the Foundation can collect large quantities of blood from the anomalous infant every single week for storage and research. But it isn't just the blood that the Foundation sees potential in. SCP-734 himself has scored incredibly well on the Esslinger Loyalty Index, the test the Foundation uses to judge the loyalty of potential applicants to the Foundation cause. As SCP-734 matures, if these scores remain consistent, he will likely be trained to become a Foundation field agent in the future. An agent capable of killing someone with a touch would, needless to say, be an asset to certain covert missions that the Foundation would probably prefer to keep off the books. Of course, the SCP Foundation recruiting certain compliant anomalies to perform missions for them is far from unprecedented. The most infamous of these is SCP-076, also known as Abel, a supernatural, eternally resurrecting swordsman and perhaps one of the finest warriors who ever lived. The Foundation took note of this and channeled his eternal thirst for battle into working with his very own mobile task force. He could assist in missions by taking out his bloodlust on enemy groups of interest and dangerous anomalies. However, this ended up working a little too well and led to disaster. Abel was so good at his job that he burned through all of his allotted missions at astonishing speed. Left with nothing more to do, Abel got antsy, which led him to turning his murderous desires on his fellow team members and then the Foundation as a whole. It was an all-out massacre before his colleagues were finally able to kill him and return him to containment. The failure of this initiative gave the very idea of letting anomalies work for the Foundation in the field a bad name. But since then, things have changed, especially with the establishment of MTF Alpha 9, aka Last Hope, a new mobile task force formed entirely of anomalous individuals and their handlers. These consist of somewhat more stable anomalies, such as Abel's counterpart SCP-073, also known as Kane. Kane cannot be harmed, with any harm befalling him simply being mirrored back on his attacker, and his vast array of knowledge makes him an incredibly useful intelligent asset. Another of the several members of Last Hope is Iris, also known as SCP-105. Much like Kane, Iris not only has anomalous powers that make her immensely valuable for missions in the field, she's also compliant and capable of listening to reason, unlike Kane. Her abilities include being able to actively surveil and even interact with photos of any location, especially when taken with her anomalous camera. Someday, SCP-734 could count himself among other anomalous Foundation agents like these, providing he continues to show promise and doesn't develop a dislike of the Foundation as he ages, since after all, he won't be a baby forever. So if you ever find yourself on the Foundation's bad side, you have a good reason to be paranoid. You'll have no idea that one day, the man who's going to kill you will approach and shake your hand with a smile. It won't be until later, when you feel that strange tingle on your palm and feel the skin starting to flake away, that you'll realize you've been a dead man walking for hours. There's an app for that. Wait, hold on, I'm Steve Jobs! Come on, no, stop it! It was a phrase so ubiquitous in the early days of the smartphone craze that it's hard to believe Apple actually has trademarked. It was a testament to a simple and immutable truth about the world these new touchscreen phones were creating. No matter how strange and obscure the need, there would be an app to fulfill it. Perhaps you remember iBeer, the app that allowed you to pretend you were drinking a tall glass of beer for some reason. 
There was Car Matey, an app that reminded you where you parked your car, in a pirate voice. And who could forget I Am Bread, a surreal game about controlling a sentient slice of bread on a quest to become toast. But there's one app out there somewhere on the market that you probably didn't download. And if you did, well, you have our sincerest apologies. Because even seeing this video pop out onto your feed probably sent a chill down your spine. Well, if that chill ever even left. Take it from one gentleman whose life took a very strange turn after downloading a certain app that the SCP Foundation calls SCP-1471. Because the sentiment, there's an app for that, doesn't exclude experiencing mortal terror. Joe Lillis, an insurance salesman from Milwaukee, had just gone through another atrocious date. After a mediocre meal and an uncomfortable 35 minutes of inane babble, sensing the whole time that she really wasn't that interested, his date excused himself to take a quick phone call outside. Sadly for Joe, she never returned, leaving him to pick up the check. Of all the many words you could use to describe poor Joe Lillis, the most pertinent would be lonely. Ever since Carol, his wife of 10 years, had passed away in a freak accident, he'd been trying to find some kind of way to fill the void. They'd been high school sweethearts, intent on spending the rest of their lives with one another. As fate would have it, only Carol would get that tainted luxury. Joe would be forced to endure life after the joy of living had run its course. He only hoped he might be lucky enough to find love again. However, Joe was on the wrong side of 40, and as so many others his age were already hitched, he could feel his options going out one by one. Would he be destined to live out the rest of his days alone? Joe didn't feel like spending the back half of his life catching reruns of Seinfeld and tending to his fish. He needed to get out there. And thankfully, like the rest of us, he lived in the internet age. He had more apps, websites, online services, and hot Russian singles in his area than he knew what to do with. So surely one would have the right person for him. He tried them all. Tinder, Hinge, Match.com, Plenty of Fish, eHarmony, Bumble, Zeusk, OkCupid, FriendFinder, Deeply Lonely Singles with Low Expectations.com, and so much more. However, all it seemed to achieve was setting him up for more disappointment. None of the dates he'd managed to get ever resulted in anything getting serious. Heck, it was a minor miracle if he even managed to get any of them on a second date. Was this it? Was this his life now? Had he only ever gotten one shot at love, and the grasping claws of fate yanked it away from him without a second thought? Would life continue on the hamster wheel of loneliness? Sleeping, getting up, eating, working, and sleeping again? Every day getting somehow both faster and slower as life trudged on to a disappointing yet inevitable conclusion? What a terrible fate to find yourself trapped in. Whenever Joe started feeling maudlin like this, he knew it was time to get proactive again. Maybe the right woman was out there. There were billions of them, after all. Surely at least one of them would be the perfect person for him. He just needed the perfect app. He'd burned through all of the most reputable apps already, and was now perusing some of the slightlier, seedier options, most of which were likely data mining fronts from the Vulcans. However, as generic app after generic app passed, something different caught his eye. The icon was a smiling cartoon dog, and its name was Mallow, version 1.0.0. This gave him a little chuckle. At the very least, it was very different branding from the rest of the dating apps he'd seen. Maybe it just been sorted into the wrong section of the app store. He decided he'd check it out and take a look at the app's description. The description read, Never settle for those awkward feelings of being alone ever again. Mallow is an exciting and interactive experience that will keep you engaged and intrigued. The anxiety of social situations can be nerve-wracking, but after just a few hours of Mallow, you will soon forget all about those painful emotions of disappointment. Be part of the new craze that is quickly becoming the next social substitute. Remember, the more you participate, the more Mallow will engage you. Your experience is completely up to you. Absolutely no ads. Enjoy. Well, it certainly provoked Joe's curiosity at the very least. He did want to banish his feelings of loneliness, and seeing as the app was free and apparently had no ads, he'd surely be foolish to not at least give it a whirl. What's the worst that could happen? He began the installation, and only then noticed that the app had no listed developer. It took up 9.8 megabytes of memory, 
which he wasn't tech-savvy enough to see any issues with. More than anything, Joe was just enticed by the prospect of finally having another chance at companionship with Malo. After all, it is the next social substitute, whatever that means. However, Joe's excitement was quickly quashed when he hit the home screen button, and noticed that the icon for the app never actually materialized. Strange. He checked the App Store portal again and saw that, according to them, the app had completely downloaded. What gives? Was it a glitch, or was Malo actually just malware? Either way, he was disheartened by the fact that this immaterial app certainly wouldn't be getting him any companionship. Or so he thought, anyway. Joe was used to disappointment by now, so he didn't take it too personally. He decided to just play out the rest of his evening on autopilot, making himself some soup, doing the laundry, watching more Seinfeld reruns, taking a cold shower, and preparing to cry himself to sleep again. Malo was already becoming a distant memory, just like all the deceptive sources of hope. But one strange thing happened that disrupted Joe's finely tuned evening routine. He received a text message. This was incredibly strange, because nobody ever seemed to text him. The last text he got was from Carol just before her accident, so it was almost surreal to hear that alert sound now, after everything that happened. He checked and saw that the text was an image attachment sent from an unknown number. Perplexed yet curious, he decided to open it. His curiosity soon gave way to a kind of melancholy nostalgia when he saw that the photo was of his and Carol's favorite cafe in town. They'd spent many a morning there, back when she was alive, treating themselves to a nice cup of coffee and perhaps a croissant. Just seeing it again caused an involuntary smile to spread across his face. It never even occurred to him, as it probably would have to others, that this could be seen as a little creepy. He hadn't frequented the bakery since Carol died. How would anyone even know that this place held any significance for him? Was it a stalker, a ghost, or just a spooky coincidence? None of these thoughts even crossed Joe's mind. He was just grateful for the surprising reminder of the happiness he'd once had. For the next couple hours, things seemed lighter. He went about his evening, checking the photo every so often and smiling, until eventually he found himself in bed, still looking into the glow of his phone. It was such a beautiful little cafe. Then he froze. He noticed something in the picture. It'd been there the whole time, but only now he was seeing rather than just looking. It was in the corner, staring through the glass of the cafe's door. So faint, he almost wanted to dismiss it as a trick of the light. It was a face. Well, not a face, more like a skull. Not a human, not anywhere near human. Long, slender, and canine, with protruding fangs and vacant white eyes. The pure white of the skull was buried in a nest of thick black hair. It looked like it was crouching behind the door, looking out and grinning, whatever the hell it was. Just seeing it changed the entire tone of the picture. It was no longer a simple reminder of bygone joy. Now, all that was radiating out of that image was a palpable sense of dread. Was someone playing some kind of awful prank on him? Just then, he was jogged from his contemplation by another alert. A new message from the same number as before. With great hesitation, he hovered his thumb over the push notification and clicked. That's when everything got a lot worse. It was a photo of a bus stop. Not just any bus stop, of course. It was stop C16 the one that Joe always took to get to work. It looked like it was taken relatively early in the morning, but nobody was there. Well, not quite nobody. There was that figure again. It stood at full height, behind the partially frosted glass that makes up the back of the bus stop. The same large black humanoid shape, with a white grinning dog skull where the face should be. Something about it terrified him on such a primal level, like the way our lizard brain reacts to some ancient apex predator. And whatever this thing was, it clearly knew something about him. How else could it stage all these photos? Joe got out of bed and looked out of the window, down onto his dark front street. Empty, thankfully. But after this surprise nightmare, he wasn't going to take any chances. He grabbed a kitchen knife from downstairs and placed it on his bedside cabinet, right next to his phone, with 911 on speed dial. Joe Lillis, a 43-year-old man, slept with the lights on that night for the first time in over 30 years. Sadly for him, the nightmare was just beginning. The next morning, Joe woke up unharmed, 
but he wasn't pleased to see that he'd gotten several more texts in his sleep. There was one taken outside of the local insurance company office where he worked. The strange creature with the skull for a face was looming around the corner, peering at the camera with its lipless grin, like it was mocking him. Another photo was taken at the local supermarket where Joe did most of his grocery shopping. The frame was centralized on the cereal aisle, bordered on both sides by walls of garish mascots endlessly repeated. Down at the far end of the aisle was a looming dark figure with that cold canine skull where a human face should be. There were a few more, but worst of all was the last one. It was taken at the cemetery, in the foreground a headstone reading, Carol Lillis, beloved wife and daughter. Joe was horrified to see that skull-faced beast was rising up behind his wife's grave, long clawed fingers curling around the top of the headstone. That was the moment that Joe decided to go to the police about all of this, before things got even more out of hand. He called an Uber to get down to the station. He certainly didn't feel like he was going anywhere near his regular bus stop after last night. He showed the photos he'd been sent so far to an officer posted at the station, and they agreed that there was certainly something strange about it. While the behavior undeniably bordered on harassment, it hadn't yet delved into criminal territory, so he would sadly be on his own until then. The best they could do was stay in touch and kept abreast of any new developments. The only sage advice they could give him was not to delete the photos, as they could always be used as evidence in court later if things escalated. This was literally the last result that Joe wanted out of this. Considering how bizarre and threatening things were getting already, he really didn't want to find out what escalation looked like in this case. But what else could he do but carry on, just trying to exercise as much caution as he could in these strange new circumstances? He went to work and tried his best to stay productive, despite the fact that every three or so hours, a new photo would arrive. Places that he liked to sit in the local parks, stores he'd frequent, restaurants he liked to eat at. The nightmare skeleton dog thing would be standing in all of them, just mugging for the camera. On one hand, every time he looked at one of the photos, Joe felt like he was giving this freak exactly what they wanted. On the other hand, how could he possibly look away? What if he missed something that could save his life? It carried on much like that until later in the evening. Joe may have not been a genius, but he was no fool either. He'd seen too many of those seedy true crime documentaries about kidnapping to take his normal route home. He took a real detour, frequently checking over his shoulder the entire time. Much to his relief, he didn't see anything out of place. Good. When he got home, he locked every door and bolted every window. Nothing would be getting the jump on him tonight. That's when the next picture came in. A photograph of Joe's empty office cubicle, with the bony face of the creature looming over the divider with a grin. He could feel his heart pounding away in his chest just looking at it. How did this thing get around like this? How was it able to infiltrate everywhere in his entire goddamn life? Suddenly, he felt a smile spreading across his face. This freak had just messed up big time. Before all these creepy photos had been taken in public places, but the one taken in his office? Oh, this crossed the line into trespassing. The police would have to do something about it now. It had given him an ace up his sleeve. That confidence faded a few hours later when he received another photo. This time, it was the skull-faced monster just standing on the sidewalk. The sidewalk that Joe remembered walking on his covert alternative route. He could feel himself break into a cold sweat. It seemed, whoever this was, he really did hold no secrets from them. Now more than ever, Joe didn't feel safe in his own home. So you can only imagine how he felt when a few hours later, he received a photo of the skull-faced stalker standing right outside his own front door, staring into the camera. It sent him rushing to the window again to check outside, but of course, nobody was there. The next day, when he called the police and updated them on the situation, they told him that they were doing all they could. The best thing he could possibly do was to remain calm, but vigilant. He needed to keep an eye on the photos being sent to him, so he could notify them if ever he was in any immediate danger. This put poor Joe's paranoia at a fever pitch. Even when he went to work, surrounded by his co-workers, by witnesses, he could scarcely tear his eyes away from his phone. He was a slave to the photos, forever waiting for the next one, only to experience crushing regret when the photo actually arrived. 
It looked like it was taken moments before it was sent to him. Joe saw himself looking at his own phone in his office cubicle, with that huge skull-faced figure looming behind him. He screamed out loud upon seeing it, and turned to see if anything was behind him. But of course, there was nothing there. The police inspected the office, talked to potential witnesses, and analyzed the photo. It showed no signs of any photographic manipulation, but there were also no witnesses around the office who claimed to see anything strange that day. There was also no security camera footage in the last several days that showed this figure coming in or out. Joe Lillis started to feel like he was going insane, and perhaps he was. But that didn't change the tangible and ever-present feeling that he was in great danger. He didn't come into work the next day. He'd received more photos like that in the night, of himself, taken in real time, with that skull face freak looming. He didn't want to leave the house. He didn't want to go anywhere anymore. He just didn't feel safe out there. How could he, with all this madness unfolding? There was a time where he could have said something like, at least it only seems confined to my phone. He might have even suspected that it had something to do with that strange Malow app he downloaded a few days prior that hadn't seemed to do anything. But this situation had evolved since then. He wasn't just seeing the creature in photos anymore. It was here. He kept seeing quick flashes of it on the other side of windows, in reflections, in the corner of his eyes, always darting away if ever he turned towards it. It was everywhere and nowhere. It was here just for him. He just knew. The police couldn't help. Nobody could help. Joe just sat in the corner of his bedroom, clutching his kitchen knife, afraid to close his eyes. It could be anywhere. It could be anywhere. It could be anywhere. We know one thing for sure. Joe Lillis never felt truly alone ever again. He always had his new friend waiting just out of sight. And if ever you're feeling lonesome and decide to download Malow version 1.0.0 yourself, then you'll never feel lonely again. If you have ever taken a trip to Sun Top Mountain in the Mount Baker Snoqualmie National Forest, Washington State, then you may have come across an old wooden structure, the Sun Top Fire Lookout. Built in the early 1930s, the building was used by the U.S. Forest Service to keep watch for any fires in the nearby woodland. At one point, Suntop Fire Lookout would have been manned 365 days a year, complete with a bed for staff who were stationed there on rotation. The single-story lookout house overlooks the scenic valleys of the White River and Huckleberry Creek, but you're not here for an informative tourist guide. You probably don't care about the frankly fascinating history of the lookout and how it was used as part of the aircraft warning service during World War II, watching for enemy planes. No, you're here because something much darker lurks inside the Sun Top Fire Lookout. And even though it appears to be a simple one-story tall wooden structure, it certainly is not short on space. SCP-3333 refers to an anomaly that the Foundation discovered inside the Suntop Fire Lookout House. The building's interior is a single square room measuring 14 feet by 14 feet, with large windows on all four sides. When standing inside Suntop Fire Lookout, looking up at the wooden ceiling, one will immediately notice a trap door. No big deal, right? A lot of places have a ceiling entrance to a small crawl space. There's probably nothing behind that trap door, apart from a dusty old attic. There's a latch that maybe once had a padlock there, but not anymore. Opening the trap door will reveal a collapsible ladder. Should anyone be brave or indeed foolish enough to begin to climb, then they'll soon find themselves right back where they started, inside Suntop Fire Lookout. Or so it will seem. The thing about being in a place like the Mount Baker Snoqualmie National Forest that surrounds Suntop Fire Lookout is that woodland areas are teeming with life. Not just plants and trees, but birds and other animals of the forest. You can never truly be alone in a setting like that. There is always life everywhere around you. So when you ascend the ladder and climb right back into the Sun Top Fire Lookout, that is the first most noticeable difference you will find. It may take a while at first, but the nagging absence of something unusually so abundant in a forest will eventually become obvious. It's quiet, far too quiet. 
No birdsong or the sound of distant calls from woodland critters. Just silence all around. Anyone ascending the ladder will find themselves in a copy of Sun Top Fire Lookout's interior, one story higher than the ground level of the small wooden building, with the stairs leading up to the front door getting taller each time to reach up to the higher and higher building. Now you know the SCP Foundation and the types of bizarre interdimensional anomalies that they're used to dealing with. Perhaps SCP-3333 is a mirror dimension, or a plane of existence where sound doesn't travel. It certainly seems to be identical to the Sun Top Fire Lookout, save for the lack of any organic life outside. Of course, it's what you'll find living inside SCP-3333 that you may want to worry about. Climbing higher up the next ladder and through the next trapdoor every time with the same result. You peer at another copy of Sun Top Fire Lookout, each one higher up than the last. What first seemed to be an innocuous, unassuming wooden building is now an endless ascension up into the heavens, towards the unknown in silence, without a shred of plant or animal life outside. As you climb, perhaps you start to think about how much higher these copies go. This might even be the biblical Jacob ladder connecting heaven and earth. That would be nice, wouldn't it? If you were gradually climbing your way up to paradise, it might make it worth the trip. But SCP-3333 is nothing that pleasant. You wouldn't be the first to attempt this long climb. When the SCP Foundation first discovered SCP-3333, a research detail set up an on-site base camp to examine this spatial anomaly. Their first exploration involved sending a member of D-Class personnel, designated D-4F-68A, up the ladder. His D number is a hexadecimal code that when translated to text reads O, oh, so we'll call him that for brevity's sake. During the first day's exploration, O was able to climb 184 iterations of SCP-3333, communicating with head researcher Dr. Williams below. On the second day, O could see a pair of figures standing motionless on a nearby ridge, but the pair could not be seen by Dr. Williams and the other researchers at the base camp. Both figures disappeared shortly after O spotted them with the camera he had been issued, and he felt uneasy, almost certain that he saw them point at him. The next day, at the 345th copy of Sun Top Fire Lookout, O's behavior started to noticeably change. Previously, he had been anxious about the long climb and hadn't questioned directions given to him by Dr. Williams. Now he seemed to speak more casually, resisting instructions, asking Williams to climb back down and even calling her Doc instead of Doctor. O also reported seeing writing on the walls, but there was no evidence of this on his camera. It appeared that something had started to affect him. It was when O reached level 527 that things seemed to change more dramatically. Rather than SCP-3333 continuing upwards, the copies of Sun Top Fire Lookout no longer had a trap door or ladder. They seemed to be arranged side by side in a grid-like pattern. Stepping out of the main doorway, O remarked on the lack of sunlight and a walkway that connected directly to the front door of the next iteration of SCP-3333. O complained about the lack of natural light, and again requested to be allowed back down. Dr. Williams instructed O to use the flashlights he was provided, but they wouldn't activate and their spare batteries had vanished. O then noticed a sudden movement, and just then his microphone and camera feed went dead almost as if someone had turned them off. It appeared that SCP-3333 had something else lurking up there. Dr. Williams oversaw the second expedition into SCP-3333. This time, members of Mobile Task Force Mod Zero, also known by the codename Characteristic Egg and Spaces, were sent up the ladder. Their ascent through the various copies of Sun Top Fire Lookout were not as eventful as O's, with no signs of mysterious figures or anxious feelings that O seemed to feel as he climbed. When they reached level 527, where the copies of the Lookout stopped progressing upwards and spread out in a pattern instead, their lights and equipment all seemed to be in working order. However, as the MTF team split up, one by one they encountered some sort of anomaly or an effect of SCP-3333 that caused each of them to vanish into the dark. Either that, or something took them. These MTF units reappeared confused, 
and Mod 5, the team's leader Graham Purcell issued an order to retreat and the entire squad went back down the ladders for several days until they finally reached the base camp again. The members of Mod Zero were adamant they did not wish to climb SCP-3333 again, but Dr. Williams was beginning to understand more of the anomaly's effects. It appeared to cause abrupt changes to people's personalities, along with some sort of phenomenon that caused things to appear and disappear the higher one climbed. Assuming these were the result of a mimetic effect, Dr. Williams dispatched a counter-memetic specialist for the next expedition. This specialist was a blind, deaf, and mute woman known as Annette, or the Null Walker, who communicated via a signaling system embedded in her hand, but was otherwise immune to any mimetic influences. Observed by Dr. Williams and Graham Purcell at base camp, Annette made her way to the top of SCP-3333, reporting that she was aware of someone watching her from outside the copies of Sun Top Fire Lookout. On her body camera, a flicker of motion occurred, something looking through the windows that ducked out of frame when the camera passed in its direction. At the apex of SCP-3333, Annette kept her flashlight off, but reported that she could detect blood, following it to what she assumed was a body. Sounds of movement surrounded her, and as Annette switched on her flashlight, Williams and Purcell saw that it wasn't a body in front of her. Instead, it was a pile of rotting organs, decomposing muscles, and discarded bones. And among the pile was a metal dog tag that read, MTF Mod 5, Graham Purcell. The same man who was sitting next to Dr. Williams at base camp. Well, the same man on the outside, at least. The explanation for everything going on inside SCP-3333, all these strange occurrences and disappearances, finally came in a video sent from Dr. Williams's cell phone. In it, a panicked Williams, covered in blood, was fleeing from something at the top of the recursive stack of SCP-3333. There was no mimetic effect at the apex of the Sun Top Fire lookout copies. Nothing was causing the people that the Foundation sent up to act unlike themselves. They simply weren't themselves anymore. According to her frantic video, Dr. Williams had discovered the truth about what else was hiding within SCP-3333. With just the right amount of vagueness and intrigue, the research team had been drawn in. It was as if they'd been lured in by the lights of an anglerfish, realizing their grim fate only too late. The D-Class O, the MTF team, even Annette had been replaced. An unknown group of entities on the top level of SCP-3333 had been carefully observing them, waiting until they would not be seen to slip in and switch places. These entities had been creating imagined anomalous effects, like O seeing figures that weren't really there, as a way of luring more bodies further up the stack. They wanted the Foundation to keep sending expeditions into SCP-3333 to keep them coming back. The mass of organs, musculature, and bones that Annette had stumbled across revealing the ruse had once belonged to Graham Purcell, before he was replaced. You see, the entities residing in SCP-3333 weren't just copying people. They weren't possessing them or mind-controlling them, or even shape-shifting to steal a person's likeness. They were taking skin. These creatures hollowed out Graham, O, Annette, and the MTF team, pulling out their innards and crawling their way inside filling these fleshy puppets and leaving their internal organs to rot. These hollowed-out people became vessels for the entities of SCP-3333 to hide in. The whole thing had been a trap, intentionally exploiting human weaknesses, intrigue, and unanswered questions. You know what they say about curiosity, and these entities used it to bring more potential vessels to the top of SCP-3333. They pretended to be the people who they had replaced, mm. imitating them so the Foundation would send more personnel to explore the tower, increasing their supply of skins. Graham's dog tag had revealed the deception, and Dr. Williams had escaped up SCP-3333. The members of the research team that had already been replaced were hot on her tail, determined to catch and hollow her out too, and by the end of her video, they had succeeded. 
A month later, though, a team delivering supplies realized what had happened and the trap door was sealed. Sun Top Fire Lookout was put under permanent guard, but at least 50 personnel were killed or replaced by one of the entities. A new mobile task force, Lambda-1 Maxwell's Demons, was created to hunt down and neutralize any of the entities that had escaped SCP-3333. But it's still unknown how many left the tower and are still out there somewhere waiting to use someone's curiosity about the strange and unknown against them. On a cold October night in 2003, Shirley Yates of Seattle, Washington was just about to get ready for bed when she heard a knock at the door. She approached the door and asked the person on the other side to identify themselves. The voice outside responded immediately. It was a salesman who just wanted a few moments of Mrs. Yates' time. This was odd for two reasons. First, it was almost 10 o'clock at night, much later than is usual for door-to-door -door salesmen. And second, the knock hadn't come from Mrs. Yates' front door. It was coming from the door to her bathroom. Has your home ever been visited by a door-to-door -door salesman? If you were born in the last 40 years, then your answer to that question is probably no. In the age of online shopping, the idea of a salesperson going from house to house hawking vacuum cleaners or encyclopedia sets feels like a relic from the past. It's highly unlikely you'd ever see one walking the streets nowadays, and equally unlikely that one would knock on your front door. However, if you live in Washington State, you might need to be wary of a certain salesman who is still doing the rounds. SCP-1879, also known as the Indoor Salesman and the Doorman, is a phenomenon that manifests randomly in homes throughout Washington. Subjects will hear persistent knocking from the interior doors of their homes, and the affected door becomes classified as SCP-1879-1. The knocking doesn't stop until the door is opened, at which point the subject will be greeted by SCP-1879-2. A Caucasian man of indeterminate age standing around 170 centimeters tall. The man will claim to be a salesman and immediately try to pitch a bizarre product to the subject whose home he's just invaded. The SCP Foundation was first alerted to the existence of the indoor salesman when they had intercepted a 911 call coming from the home of Mrs. Shirley Yates. She had opened the door to her bathroom in an attempt to get the salesman to stop knocking, and once he was in her home, he refused to leave. According to Yates, he kept disappearing in and out of random doors in her house. Foundation Field Agent Rogers was equipped with a recording device and sent in to investigate the case with several other agents. When he arrived at the home, he found Mrs. Yates inconsolable. SCP-1879-2 was still rapidly talking at her, and strangely enough, the product he was holding and trying to sell to her was a Border Collie puppy. As soon as Agent Rogers entered the room, the man shifted his attention away from Mrs. Yates and towards him. He then started trying to sell the puppy to Agent Rogers. Agent Rogers did not want to purchase this puppy, but he found that the man spoke so quickly and urgently, he couldn't get a word in edgewise. The man was begging Rogers to take the puppy, practically shoving it in his face, saying that he didn't need any money, and that the only payment he needed would be some of your time. Rogers grew so annoyed at being talked over and interrupted that he ordered the other field agents to apprehend the indoor salesman. They did so, but as soon as the agents walked him out of the front door of the house, he disappeared without a trace. The agents remained in the area to monitor the situation. SCP-1879-2 manifested again in Mrs. Yates' home six hours later, still trying to trade the puppy for no money, just a little of her time. Twelve years, to be precise. After hours and hours of being worn down by this supernaturally pushy salesman, Yates relented and agreed to take the puppy, and immediately disappeared. The indoor salesman then disappeared himself through the closet door before he could be apprehended again. At a loss for what to do, the agents administered Class A amnestics to Mrs. Yates' family and left. The reason for her disappearance wasn't fully known until 12 years later in 2015, when she reappeared in the same spot she disappeared from, having no concept of how much time had passed. The puppy really had just cost her 12 years of her life. Stories like that of Shirley Yates have popped up all over the state in the years since, from Everett to Walla Walla and everywhere in between. 
Due to the random nature of SCP-1879 events and the way the indoor salesman can disappear instantly in and out of any door in a building, the SCP Foundation has been unable to capture him. The best they've been able to do is monitor 911 calls from across the state, listening for key words that might indicate another SCP-1879 infestation. When such an event is reported, the Foundation deploys Mobile Task Force Row 4, aka Shoe Salesman. This task force's entire purpose is to minimize the amount of harm the indoor salesman is able to cause by intercepting him before he can make a sale. This is a very important task, as evidenced by the story of Mrs. Yates, since while the products this salesman sells might be innocent, he doesn't accept payment in any normal currency. The price he asks for his products are always bizarre and often deadly. If all someone loses is 12 years of their life, they could be considered to be getting off easy. In one instance, the product being sold was a single red rose in exchange for the subject's heart. Once the deal was sealed, the subject dropped dead on the spot, with an autopsy revealing that his heart and circulatory system vanished from inside his body. In another, the indoor salesman offered 220 bananas and told the subject to simply give him some sugar. The subject agreed, and all candied goods in the home disappeared. In a third, the indoor salesman was trying to sell a thermonuclear warhead, the price of which was the subject's soul. The subject accepted, and at first nothing seemed to have happened. The Foundation confiscated the warhead and placed it into non-anomalous containment. Later that day, the subject went to listen to some music, only to find that two of her vinyl records had gone missing, Lady Soul and Almighty Fire, by world-famous soul singer Aretha Franklin. So. Even though he's incredibly invasive, annoying, and his transactions can be deadly, the indoor salesman still maintains a sense of humor. The fact that the Foundation can't capture the indoor salesman means that a lot of questions about him remain unanswered. The biggest by far is why he does what he does. In most SCP-1879 events, the indoor salesman seems frantic and desperate to make a sale. Often he will refer to having quotas and deadlines to meet, which implies some other unseen entity that he has to answer to. These questions remain unanswered, because all attempts to interrogate the indoor salesman have been unsuccessful. When he manifests in a location, it's impossible to get him to stray from his sales pitch, and he disappears as soon as he successfully sells his wares. However, there was one instance where, after an SCP-1879 event took place, Foundation agents were there to witness a rare interaction between the indoor salesman and his mysterious employers. Agent Rogers and the rest of the shoes salesmen were called out to a home in Spokane, where rapid knocking had begun to emanate from the bedroom door. Equipped with recording devices, Rogers was able to record the voice of the indoor salesman coming from inside the bedroom. In the recording, the salesman grumbled to himself about not being able to meet his quota by tomorrow, saying that if he didn't, he'd be stuck in this world for the next century. He started knocking again, yelling through the door that he knew they were home. He kept knocking until he was interrupted by the sound of a phone ringing. The indoor salesman was heard picking it up and Rogers managed to record the conversation. The person calling was, apparently, the indoor salesman's boss, who was calling to complain about his performance. Only one side of the conversation was heard, but evidently the indoor salesman's boss wasn't too happy about receiving two Aretha Franklin albums as payment instead of an actual human soul. The indoor salesman apologized for the joke, then told his boss, It won't happen again. Please don't hurt it. I'll meet the quota this time, I swear. He hung up grumbling to himself again, I better get to move up to Elise Accounting this time. I've paid my dues and then some. Rogers finally opened the door to the apparent disappointment of the indoor salesman, who was hoping to speak with the home's owner and was quite annoyed at having another one of his sales interrupted by MTF Row 4. Rogers tried to ask the indoor salesman who he'd just been speaking to on the phone, but as usual, the salesman started talking over him. Now see here, let's think logically, he said. You know I'm not going to tell you anything. I know you're not likely to buy what I'm selling, so let's just move on to greener pastures. I'm coming up close to a deadline, and I'm sure you're swamped with making sure good people don't lose their jobs, so I'll just be on my way and let you do that. Ciao! The indoor salesman tried to close the door, but Agent Rogers blocked it with his arm. He was tired of this SCP giving him the runaround, 
and he was going to keep the indoor salesman here if it was the last thing he did. He demanded the entity stay and be interviewed, and other members of the task force apprehended the salesman, making sure he couldn't leave the room. The indoor salesman, now held in place by several armed men, seemed to finally relent. He told Rogers, I'm busy, so I'll tell you what. I'm gonna give you something, no money out of your pocket, and we'll call it even. Sound good? Rogers, just wanting to get this whole thing over with, agreed to those terms. Three seconds later, every agent on the scene was dead and the indoor salesman was able to straighten his tie, pick up his briefcase, and walk through the door to the bathroom. When the bodies of Agent Rogers and the rest of the MTF Row 4 were examined by Foundation scientists, the cause of death was found to be, in every case, thousands of coins suddenly appearing in not only their pockets, but also inside their stomachs, lungs, and even under their skin. Later that day, the indoor salesman was reported at a home in the same neighborhood. He was seen trying to sell the house's owner, 80-year-old retiree Alan Johnson, a Glock 18 pistol in exchange for his attention. As he had done so many times before, the indoor salesman disappeared through another door before the Foundation was able to reach the scene. And when the SCP arrived, they found Mr. Johnson still alive, but now missing his brief frontal cortex the part of the brain that controls attention. It's likely that, because of the nature of the entity, SCP-1879 might be entirely impossible to contain. The Foundation might never find out anything more than what they already know about the indoor salesman, the way he's able to manifest behind closed doors, or the reason he has to keep filling quotas for an unseen boss who apparently doesn't have a very good sense of humor. So, if you're ever in Washington State, be careful who you open your doors to, especially if the knocking you hear is coming from inside your house. In a remote part of Russia, a mysterious disease outbreak was tearing through a tiny farming village with terrifying side effects. There was no cure, no clue to where it came from, and worst of all, the disease's terrifying impact didn't end with death. No, it was after those carrying the disease died that the real horrors started. After an agonizing fever that leaves the victims writhing in pain, they quickly succumb to the disease, only to rise from their graves to wreak havoc on the living. The virus continues to spread until the corpses outnumber those trying to hide from them, as the world spirals into almost certain ruin. It sounds like the plot of a zombie movie, but for the SCP Foundation, this is anything but fiction, and the terror that unfolded in that little Siberian town is the first recorded encounter with SCP-610 also known as the flesh that hates. First, livestock began to vanish from farms. Theft or wild animals were suspected, but no suspects could be found, and no mutilated remains turned up. The animals weren't being stolen, and they weren't being eaten, so what happened to them? With no more animals left to lose, the farmers themselves then began to disappear, but the authorities refused to take the missing persons' cases seriously. The missing farmers' families would contact the police, make a report, and then the whole thing was forgotten. It was written off just as another unsolved disappearance, which wasn't uncommon in the wild and unforgiving region. Then, the police themselves began to disappear. The families of the missing farmers would sometimes report strange sounds from the surrounding woods, describing moans and inhuman screeches of pain. One young boy reported seeing a cow with what he described as tentacles lurking around the edge of the trees. Regional police were dispatched to the location and ordered to investigate and report back on their findings within 24 hours, but the units sent to the area didn't report back and were never heard from again. Upon learning of the reports, the Russian government grew increasingly concerned, fearing domestic insurgency or foreign espionage of some kind could be at play. They sent a small team of special agents to the area, and one by one, those agents disappeared, just like the others before them. It seemed no one who went into the village after the disappearances started ever came out again. They had all simply vanished. Desperate for answers, the Russian government contacted the only people in the world who could help, the SCP Foundation. What the Foundation found over the course of their investigation would shock and unnerve them, going beyond anything they had previously discovered. Before the investigation officially began, the affected area was sealed off by the Russian government. Not knowing if it would be safe to send researchers into the containment perimeter, the Foundation set up a small camera-mounted unit, nicknamed Herbie, 
to capture footage of whatever remained of the village. The images captured by Herbie revealed what exactly had become of the people in this doomed village and the true nightmarish nature of SCP-610. SCP-610 is a Keter-class entity, meaning it's an anomaly that's exceedingly difficult to contain consistently or reliably, with containment procedures often being extensive and complex. 610 is a highly contagious skin disease that initially manifests like an ordinary allergic reaction, with symptoms including increased sensitivity, itching, and a rash. But within just three hours of those initial symptoms appearing, the rash starts to turn into masses of scar tissue on the chest and arms. These masses spread over the legs and back of the victim and completely consume them in thick, rubbery flesh within five hours. Once they're covered, the victim will cease all vital functions. Unfortunately for them, and doubly so for those around them, they do not stay dead. About three minutes after expiring, the victim's vitals will restart at a heightened rate, and the masses of flesh encasing their body will begin to move and multiply mutating them into a form beyond anything resembling the human they once were. The specific type of mutation varies from case to case, but has included the head becoming massive and bulbous, the growth of extra limbs, and, in especially gruesome cases, the victim's body splitting apart to allow extra tendrils of flesh to sprout from the open wound. Occasionally, an infected person will stop moving and become rooted to the ground in a set location. Once it is settled, their flesh will spread itself across the ground encasing all nearby objects in flaps of scar tissue. The infected that maintain their mobility are highly aggressive, even violent, and will attempt to infect any living thing that comes into their line of sight. The disease does not only infect humans, and can take over any living organism within a matter of hours. Due to the highly contagious and dangerous nature of the disease, safe observation of infected specimens and areas is only possible with drones and mounted cameras. This brings us back to Herbie the first such mounted camera to record footage of the infected area. Herbie was deployed to an infection site, also known as Site A, without any damage. It remained at the outside perimeter of the village for two hours, observing several infected humans and fire damage to many of the homes, before following an infected into an intact house. Herbie's camera feed captured the infected person entering the house and sitting down at the table inside. There were several other infected humans in the house, and one unidentified infected creature that remained immobile under the table. After viciously assaulting one of the other infected humans, the infected returned to the table and began to lay out plates on top of it. Pieces of its flesh began to wriggle and tear away from its body before settling onto each plate. Once the plates were filled, the infected sitting at the table began to grab at the flesh and crush it into their mouths in a perverse imitation of a normal mealtime gathering. After capturing this stomach-churning display, Herbie left the house and continued to explore the village. The recorded footage of a large stack of bodies that seemed to be made up of both Russian military and civilians, with an infected sitting on top. As Herbie maneuvered towards the remains of the town hall, an infected grabbed the rover off the ground. Herbie's camera was able to capture the face of the infected that grabbed the rover. The face was that of a young girl, around 10 years old, strangely intact atop a large, distorted body. The final moments of Herbie's camera feed captured the infected girl's face bursting open, revealing tendrils of flesh that pulled Herbie into the gaping maw. Then, the feed cut to black. Herbie was regarded as lost, but the video feed briefly resumed five hours later, showing the camera covered with an unidentified slime. After this, the video feed was cut for good, and Herbie abandoned in sight A. The Foundation has sent several manned expeditions into Site A, where many expedition forces have fallen victim to the infected. Several operatives were also lost in an earthquake that revealed a network of underground tunnels. A manned expedition into these tunnels was attempted, and the video feed that was captured by the researchers on the expedition was deeply disturbing. There were images of an abandoned church filled with infected, and a mass of uninfected or partially infected human captives. The final moments of the video feed from this expedition captured several operatives being murdered by an infected human wielding a farming scythe, indicating that the infected are capable of using simple weaponry in addition to brute force. The use of this weapon, paired with the presence of captives in the underground tunnels, paints a terrifying picture of the kind of organization the infected are capable of. No more manned expeditions have been attempted, or if they have, they have been highly classified.
Ordinarily, once a new SCP is discovered, it is placed in containment at the Foundation, with special procedures in place so that it can be studied or even neutralized in the rare occasions where it's deemed necessary. When it comes to SCP-610, though, containment might just be impossible. It simply covers too much area and is too dangerous to expose to human researchers. Instead, all infected areas have been isolated with the permission of the Russian government. There is an official perimeter established around these areas, and any civilians that approach them are told to leave under the pretense of ongoing military operations. For once, a top-secret military project is the more innocent answer. Armed guards are placed at the perimeter of every infected area, and any living thing with symptoms of SCP-610 spotted near the perimeter is to be immobilized, killed, and burned from as far away as possible. Any living thing that comes in contact with SCP-610, whether a soldier, a scientist, or a civilian, is immediately terminated and their remains destroyed. If someone comes within three meters of an infected organism, they will be quarantined and remotely examined to determine if they have been infected. While the spread of SCP-610 can be airborne, it has been determined to be far less contagious when spread through air particles as opposed to physical contact. The infection sites remain active to this day, like modern-day leper colonies, though they are isolated from the general population and the military is doing everything in their power to contain the infected. SCP-610 is still very much alive. It is rare for an entity to exist that the Foundation cannot truly contain but can only try to guard against, and that makes this infection all the more terrifying. Who knows how much it has mutated over the years, growing, spreading, hungry for new hosts. There is still so much that the Foundation does not know about the flesh that hates, such as how it works, what it can do, or even where it came from, since the origin of the first infection is still, at this point, entirely unknown. It has shown itself to be capable of learning, planning, and protecting itself, so who is to say that it couldn't figure out a way to escape from its isolated area? It is so highly contagious and spreads so quickly that just one tiny infected rabbit and one inattentive soldier could be enough for SCP-610 to reach the general population. If it did, its violent, destructive nature and hatred for all life would mean that everything, not just the people, but animals, plants, and the world itself, could be at risk. And no one is ready for this kind of infection, a disease that turns the human body against itself, turns our skin into a weapon and a tomb, stripping away identity, humanity, and everything that isn't made of the same hateful flesh. So let's hope that the perimeter holds, and the next time you feel a little itchy, try not to think about what might happen next. Addiction. It takes many forms and wears many faces, like a demon walking among us. It takes over your life, crawling in and changing you from the inside out. Breaking an addiction is hard, but oftentimes not giving it up is much harder. That was a difficult lesson to learn for three people. Joey Walker, Dolly McGregor, and Paul Abels. These three had never met one another, and now they never will. But each one of them had two things in common. First was that each had an addiction they felt like they couldn't shake. And second was that they each had a run-in with SCP-666. Joey Walker was at the end of his rope when he encountered it. Everyone has bad days, but for Joey every day for the last 15 years has been a bad day. He was pushing 40 with nothing to show for it, except credit card debt, a scraggly beard, and a beat up old Mustang. But booze had always been there for him. No matter how bad things got, he could always count on a glass full of comfort at the end of the day. But to paraphrase a quote by Stephen King, sometimes when a man takes a drink, the drink takes the man and Joey Walker had been long since taken. He was a transient worker, doing jobs wherever jobs needed doing, but he never expected that he would end up all the way to Tibet working construction. Not that he was complaining. Sure, it was cold, but there was plenty of Tibetan Chang to enjoy. It was a drink so good that legends even say that yetis would raid villages in the mountains just to get a little taste. Joey had taken a liking to the Chang, and it was what he had been drinking when he crashed his car up in the mountains, leaving him stranded in the snow. Joey had survived the crash itself, but he knew he wouldn't last long in the cold. 
He needed shelter. That's why he felt like he could hardly believe his luck when he first saw the yurt, a kind of traditional Tibetan tent made from animal skins. Joey had never seen anything quite like it, but any refuge from the storm would do. He pushed forward through the snow and climbed inside. But the inside of the yurt was nothing like the outside. In fact, it seemed like an exact replica of his favorite sports bar back in Atlantic City. It was warm. There was all the old memorabilia on the walls, and every screen was showing the Saints wiping the floor with the Colts in the 2010 Super Bowl. Joey didn't even question it. He just smiled and approached the bar. He even recognized the bartender, Malcolm, a good old friend of his. Malcolm smiled back at him, but there was something oddly menacing in his grin. Welcome back, he said. I thought you'd hauled your sorry keister off to Tibet. Guess you gave up on that too, just like everything else. <laughs> well, except... Malcolm pushed a glass of beer towards him across the bar and glared. Joey didn't understand why Malcolm was being so aggressive, but he didn't question that either. He grabbed the glass and drank it up, guzzling it down before slamming the empty glass down on the bar. Malcolm kept the drinks coming, round after round, and Joey kept knocking them back. He didn't notice when the TV screens turned to static. He didn't notice when the other patrons at the bar began to jitter and twitch, turning little by little into something less than human. He didn't even notice when Malcolm's face started melting off his skull as long as he kept pouring. Before he could even really understand what was happening to him, Joey Walker was dead. His liver and kidneys had given out on him. His corpse would later be found frozen on the Tibetan mountainside, just 30 feet away from his crash car. The coroner's report would list his cause of death as accidental, but this was no accident. He'd fallen victim to SCP-666, an anomalous yurt known to some as the Spirit House. The being he'd call Malcolm is known to the Foundation as SCP-666-1, and Joey had failed its challenge. Sadly for our inebriated friend, the penalty for failure is death. Next on our list of human tragedies comes Dolly McGregor, a 62-year-old woman from Anaheim, California. Dolly was never averse to the drink, but she knew how to enjoy her mojitos in moderation. You rarely get to 62 if you don't. And Dolly could tell people with pride that she had two children and six grandchildren, whom she didn't see nearly often enough for her liking. She also had over $100,000 in gambling debt owed to a number of casinos on the Vegas Strip. Ever since her husband, Albert, had passed away several years prior, shooting craps, playing blackjack, and willing away the hours in front of the slot machines had been a welcome change from loneliness. But in Vegas, fortunes can change in an instant. Dolly had gone from being on a hot winning streak to losing everything. The casinos extended her lines of credit until she was gambling with money she'd never be able to pay back. But that didn't stop her. She'd been selling off everything, even remortgaging the house that Albert had built with his own two hands to try and keep up with her ballooning debts. Still, it wasn't enough, but she couldn't stop either. It wasn't even that she felt good about it anymore. It was just that she only ever felt normal among the flashing lights of slot machines and the clatter of dice. She needed to get away, as far away as possible. She heard about people reaching spiritual enlightenment in Tibet. They'd discover God, or gods, or sometimes just a sense of inner peace. Whatever it was, she needed to find it and get this demon off her back. So she took the last of her savings and flew off to Tibet to clear her head. She didn't know if there were any casinos in Lhasa, but if there were, her money would surely be no good there. It was exactly what she needed. But Tibet wasn't the promised land she thought it would be. Wherever Dolly went, there she was, with the same vices and demons chasing her. The first night she spent in Lhasa, she used the hotel Wi-Fi to download an online poker app on her phone. This culminated in another couple thousand dollars lost, and a panic attack that caused Dolly to throw her phone into her toilet before wandering off into the wilderness. She just needed to get away. But time and space got away from her, and eventually she was knee-deep in snow. Where had she come from? Where could she go? It quickly dawned on her that if she didn't find some kind of shelter soon, she'd be done for. But all she could do was keep walking. That's when she happened upon SCP-666. The yurt was like an oasis on the barren mountainside. 
She didn't expect comfort inside, but it could at least provide her some shelter until the staff back at the hotel noticed she was gone. Then they'd come and save her, right? Right. But when she passed through the yak leather flap into the yurt, Dolly wasn't in an ancient tent in the Tibetan wilderness. She was on a casino floor. There was a big, beautiful roulette table before her, attended to by a grinning, well-dressed croupier. They were flanked by an army of slot machines, and all the pleasing, familiar sounds of cheerful gambling rang out through the air. She approached the table, and the croupier shook his head in what seemed like disappointment. Ah, back again, eh, Dolly? He said with a sigh. Of course, I should have expected it. After all, what else do you have in that empty little life of yours, hmm? Without all this, you'd be nothing, right? Nothing at all. Since Albert died and the kids want nothing to do with you, we're all you've got. So, Dolly, what'll it be? Red or black? Are you feeling lucky? His words wounded Dolly, but that wouldn't stop her. She grabbed her chips and put them all on red. One last spin couldn't hurt. What did she have to lose? She blinked, and she wasn't sitting at the table anymore. She was upright, but she wasn't standing. Her wrists and ankles were bound to something, to a wheel. A giant roulette wheel, like it was some kind of medieval torture device. The croupier was standing across from her, well, something that used to be a croupier. His face was flickering in and out. Sometimes it was human, sometimes it was a mass of eyes and teeth. More demons were sitting all at the slot machines behind him, pulling levers made from human bones. Good choice, Dolly, the croupier said. Red suits you. He reached out and gave the wheel a spin. Dolly was lost in an overwhelming, pulsing cascade of lights, colors, and sounds. The horrific, tinny noises of slot machines and the laughter of the demonic croupier. She was lost in panic and terror as she just kept spinning and spinning and spinning. When her body was eventually found, her muscles were in the advanced stages of atrophy, as though she hadn't been moving for years. Her brain was rotted, and the cause of death was determined as sudden cardiac arrest after an extended period of sleep deprivation and malnutrition. Dolly's family <laughs> would never really know what happened to her. The SCP Foundation has learned a lot about SCP-666 after containing it in Site-73. Its anomalous effects, namely vivid, complex, and potentially fatal hallucinatory experiences only affect those with some kind of addiction or dependency. To anyone else entering the yurt, it's just a normal tent, but any addicts who enter will fall under its spell and are generally transported back to the place where their addiction was at its strongest. There they'll encounter SCP-666-1, an entity that takes the form of a figure from the subject's life, normally one heavily involved in facilitating their addiction. Any kind of addiction seems to trigger it. Alcohol, drugs, gambling, pornography, food, self-destructive behavior, even video games. SCP-666 kills its victims with a twisted mockery of the very thing that they were dependent on in life. It was only with Paul Abels that the Foundation started discovering the other side of the coin. By almost all accounts, Paul is a worse person than anyone on this list. He got addicted to hard drugs early on in life, and took up a life of violent crime to support his habit. He murdered two people during a liquor store robbery before being convicted and sentenced to death. He'd then been picked up as a D-Class by the SCP Foundation, and selected as a test subject for SCP-666 due to his history of drug abuse. The Foundation expected to be adding his body to the incineration pile sometime soon. None of the researchers working on the case predicted what actually ended up happening. Paul was forced to enter the yurt. Not long after, he found himself standing in a place he'd done everything to try to forget. The dark graffiti-stained alley where he'd been sold his first hit. This was the place, the place that destroyed his life. Every bad decision he'd ever made could be traced back to here, and specifically to one man, Frank. Frank was his first dealer, and now here he was, standing right across from him once more. Frank was grinning like a demon. Come on, Polly, he said. You got it, Trash. We both know what you're gonna do. Don't you feel it? The itch? Come on, one more hit, Polly. That's all you need to feel better. It's time to take your medicine. Frank, or this thing pretending to be Frank, was right. He did feel the itch. He did want it. 
Maybe he was no better than this. He began to reach out towards Frank, but then he abruptly pulled his hand back. Frank's eyes widened in genuine surprise as Paul replied, I'm sorry, that's not me anymore. SCP-666-1 gave a smile and said, Maybe it isn't, Polly. Maybe it isn't. When Paul Abels was removed from the SCP-666 yurt by one of the attending guards, the Foundation researchers discovered something amazing. Paul was very much alive, and more incredibly, he didn't feel the cravings anymore. His addiction was gone. And further tests showed that Paul wasn't a one-off event. In fact, anyone who denies the temptation of SCP-666 will see their addictions miraculously disappear when they finally leave. After this, it became clear to the Foundation that SCP-666 isn't just a way to punish addicts. It's a kind of test. Those who want to change, who are willing to truly confront their demons and resist the pull of temptation are rewarded with the one thing they want most in their life. Freedom from their addiction. SCP-666 can be your doom or your salvation. And like most things in life, you get what you give. In almost all respects, Kevin O'Reilly is your average 50-something Irish man. He lives in County Cork with his wife, Martha, where he spends his day working at a local accountancy firm and during his free evenings, he likes to take quiet walks through the nearby woods. There is only one remarkable thing that can be said about Kevin. He was the second human ever to encounter an example of SCP-3199 a dangerous Keter-class anomaly that has the power to knock humanity off the top of the food chain, if left unchecked. We know what you're thinking. What about the first human? Don't worry, we'll get to him. But we can assure you, he's anything but unremarkable. Back to Kevin. He was enjoying one of his nightly walks when he heard a horrible shrieking sound in the distance. It sounded like a woman was being murdered, and just hearing it chilled poor Kevin to his core. His first instinct was to run to the woman's aid and do whatever he could, but there was a lurking anxiety under the surface. The echoing memory of an old childhood legend, the Banshee. A monstrous ghostly woman of Irish folklore whose blood-curdling screams always foretell death. But those were all just stories, surely. Grim omens to stop children from straying too far from the path. Kevin took his first brave step in the direction of that awful screaming, repeating the quiet mantra of, there's no such thing as monsters to himself again and again. If only he knew just how wrong he was. He ran deeper into the forest, following the awful sounds. Whoever this woman was, she certainly had some pipes on her. The screaming had been going on for minutes on end now, and it didn't seem to show any signs of subsiding. The sky above had darkened from everything to full-on night by the time Kevin reached the source of the screaming. Kevin found himself in a clearing in the forest, but in all his years of walking down here, he'd never seen it before. There was a ramshackle old cottage, rotten with age and damp, and next to it, a rusty old hut made from corrugated iron, like a kind of oversized chicken coop. From the tinny, echoing quality of the screams, he knew that they were coming from inside the hut. Was a woman being held captive here? Kevin was a smart man. He approached the tin hut quietly, not saying a word. If this woman had indeed been captured and was now being held against her will, it wouldn't help the situation to potentially alert her captor to his presence. This quick thinking is the reason that Kevin O'Reilly is still alive today. Because when he arrived outside the tin hut and peered in through the window, what he saw inside was not a woman. In fact, it wasn't even human. The beast that Kevin saw inside the hut was nothing short of a crime against nature. A twisted abomination that was only vaguely humanoid. Its bloated, fleshy body dripped with some kind of viscous fluid, and it looked more like a plucked, rotten chicken than a person. The creature was shrieking and wailing, its huge body convulsing in the coop. It was making a gurgling, gagging noise, like something was strangling it. Kevin felt like he was going to be sick, but the monster beat him to it. It doubled over, its wretched, lipless mouth stretched open to freakish proportions and started to vomit something out. 
It was a gray, leathery mass, covered in dark red blood that soon flopped out onto the ground, among a number of other masses that looked just like it. The creature then gave one final wail and spewed out a red stream of blood and bile onto the masses. That's when Kevin realized what he was looking at. Eggs. A pile of big, unnatural eggs. The foul-smelling bile that the creature had just vomited up had no effect on the eggs, but it seemed to burn and corrode the surrounding environment. It hissed against the metal as thin wisps of steam rose from the scorch marks. Kevin was horrified, but also entranced by the bizarre sight, until the creature stood back up and began to turn towards him. Kevin didn't let his morbid curiosity get the better of him. He turned and sprinted out of the forest, knowing that if he lingered for even a second longer, he wouldn't return home alive. He ran and ran, and finally heard the wailing fade into the distance behind him. This was the first ever outside brush with a specimen of SCP-3199, also known as Humans Refuted. Sadly, it would be far from the last, and would remain one of the rare few that wasn't deadly. When Kevin got back to town, he immediately told everyone what he saw. There's a monster in the woods, and it's breeding. He even told the local newspaper, which printed the headline, Be Sighted in Local Forest. It was enough to get the SCP Foundation's attention. Field agents were sent into the town proper to suppress the information leaking about the creature and gather any additional information they needed to assess whether they were dealing with a real anomaly here or just another crank. Straight away, though, the agents could tell from Kevin's demeanor that he had seen something truly awful. He was given amnestics, and Mobile Task Force Omega-19 were dispatched to secure and contain the creatures that Kevin had seen. They had 12 well-armed personnel, trained and prepared to deal with anything. Or so they thought. They were led by Corporal Duncan, a seasoned MTF operative, and they used state-of-the-art night vision technology to gain a tactical advantage in the dead of night. All they had to work on, though, was the visual description provided by Mr. O'Reilly. It didn't take long for them to find the same clearing out in the woods. There was the rotten old cottage and the metal coop, just like Kevin had described. Two younger MTF members, Private McLeod and Private Langley, were eager to take the lead and prove themselves as they explored the dilapidated nightmare of a house. Once inside, they heard strange noises, what they assumed must have been footsteps coming from deeper in the home. They crept further in, and that's when Private McLeod first noticed it the shape of a large, pale, bulbous figure at the end of a long hallway, shivering slightly in the cold. Compared to some of the hardened killers he had heard about in combat training, this creature looked like a piece of cake. This half-man, half-chicken, it was almost a walking joke. He leveled his weapon and grinned as he approached the creature, but Private McLeod had made a fatal mistake. He underestimated his enemy. In a later Foundation debriefing interview, Corporal Duncan would report with a dull horror what he saw happen to Private McLeod that terrible day. He'd never seen a smile fade from someone's face so fast. As the creature turned, shrieked, and sprinted down the hallway towards Private McLeod, the poor private barely even had time to raise his gun, his hands quivering with panic. Though even if McLeod had been quicker on the draw, it probably wouldn't have saved him. As the beast approached, it spewed its foul, stinking red bile onto McLeod's face. It was a sudden burning sensation so powerful that he passed out in an instant, his lower face dripping off of his own skull. He was dead in mere moments. Then, the beast leapt forward and began attacking Private Langley, biting and stinging and spewing more of its deadly, acidic liquid. By the time it was done, there was barely any of Langley left to retrieve from the house. The ten surviving task force members opened fire on the creature, but along with being surprisingly fast, it could also apparently take quite a licking. Even when Corporal Duncan managed a direct hit on the creature's chest, blowing a portion of it away, the monster just let out the most awful scream and continued fighting. Corporal Duncan admits that, to this day, that scream and the moonlight shining through the hole in the creature's chest continue to haunt him. When the monster was finally subdued, they were able to take it back to the nearby evac chopper and begin the journey to the nearest containment facility. 
But things took another terrible turn during that fateful flight. The creature's body began to convulse before vomiting up a pair of large, leathery eggs. Without a moment's hesitation, the eggs began to bulge and tear open, and a pair of rapidly growing SCP-3199 instances crawled out, attacking the mobile task force members huddled together in the cramped confines of the helicopter. Once the second onslaught was over, only four of the remaining ten members of personnel were left alive. The Foundation had discovered a formidable new foe. The specimens were brought back to Site 114 and placed in a modified version of the standard Keter class containment chamber. It was fitted with acid resistant steel walls and a series of transparent resin blocks to store the specimens inside for constant observation. But the creatures weren't given Keter class for nothing. Escape attempts are frequent, and whenever they happen, the number of creatures in containment increases. The most frightening detail of SCP-3199 is the fact that it's impossible to reduce the number of them in existence. Each creature has a unique stomach-like organ inside its body, which holds an egg in reserve. While it's possible to destroy one of the creatures, the eggs have proven to be almost indestructible. As a result, when one of them dies, the egg within it hatches and immediately grows into a replacement. And if the creatures are ever allowed to roam free, they begin laying eggs in any unoccupied space they can find, causing their numbers to grow. In theory, if left unchecked, they could supplant the human race with their own species in hardly any time at all. The only solution that the Foundation has found is submerging the creatures in sedative-laced water, as the beasts seem to inherently register water-filled areas as occupied space and therefore do not begin laying eggs while submerged. But even the Foundation's most optimistic minds still admit this is only a temporary solution. But where did these awful creatures come from? After the chaos of the first mission, the Foundation had dispatched an additional mobile task force surface team Delta 029E to perform a second sweep of the house and figure out what had been going on during the two decades of preceding silence. Inside, the team managed to collect a number of strange objects to bring back as evidence of the peculiar activities that had taken place there. Among these were a number of chicken carcasses that bore evidence of surgical dissection, a pair of chicken feather quills, and an A5 hardcover notebook labeled New Breed Manifesto. Its writer is believed to be deceased, most likely as a result of SCP-3199. But the final note scrawled inside the book and dated 1973 provides some insight into what had occurred inside that dilapidated shack in Ireland. It reads, If you're reading this, then lucky, lucky you. 400,000 hours from now, and it'll be warm and wet and warm, and the wonderful versatilivessa versatility of inferior human DNA will birth a better era, a stronger era. One where the food and water will be nothing but things of the past as we make and make and make more until I really have as much time! That's why I envy you so, so much. You'll have all the time you need. Time will be a thing of all the time will be on and on and death will be life. Life new needs things to live. New life will be part of life from now on! These are the last words of the deranged mad scientist who created SCP-3199, perhaps under the demented belief that somehow they would make the world a better place. Personally, we don't think SCP-3199 have any interest in improving the world, but whether we like it or not, their insane creator is right about one thing. There are problem now. Agent Carla Mendoza was one of the best field agents that Site-41 had ever seen. She was professional, cool under pressure, and when the situation demanded it, she could be a straight-up badass. During a Chaos Insurgency raid on the site, she'd single-handedly killed four different insurgents, the last one with her bare hands. During containment breaches, she'd always be the first one charging into the fray, her Foundation standard-issue Beretta drawn and ready to fire. 
Agent Mendoza was so devoted to the job that she took up the site director's offer to start living on site, so she could always be there to help if an emergency situation unfolded. After all, when it all hits the fan, you want someone as utterly unshakable as Agent Mendoza on your side. The job had thrown the worst of the worst at her and she'd never even flinched. So surely nothing could scare Agent Mendoza, right? After a long day of kicking ass, taking names, and filling in the properly mandated amount of SCP Foundation debriefing paperwork, Agent Mendoza retired to her Site 41 quarters. She felt exhausted and sweaty, so before heading to bed to watch some wonderful SCP Explained videos on her phone, how kind, she decided to take a quick shower. The last thing she expected was for this particular shower to become, well, let's say, Hitchcockian. The water was running hot and clean, filling the air with steam. Agent Mendoza was lathering up her hair when she first heard the noise, heavy, wheezing breaths coming from just behind the shower curtain. The second she heard it, Agent Mendoza felt a kind of brutal, crushing anxiety that she'd never experienced before like a hand was reaching into her chest and squeezing her heart. The self-defense training that had been encoded into her muscle memory over years of working at the Foundation kicked into effect. In a blind panic, she struck out at the shower curtain, causing it to sway outwards and land directly on the face of Mendoza's wheezing voyeur. Who or whatever it was, it was standing right there, less than a meter away from the shower. The wheezing carved into Mendoza's ears like a butcher's knife. What an awful, monstrous sound. And despite the fact that the shower curtain obscured its face, she could still somehow see it. The way a defenseless animal can sense an approaching predator without ever locking eyes on it, and just somehow know that it's too late for them to escape now. Every training session, every achievement, Every piece of battle-hardening experience, it all evaporated in the presence of that thing. Mendoza was so terrified she might as well have been a child. The monster just stood there beyond the curtain. Its raw, fleshy face parted into a freakishly wide, yellow-toothed grin. She didn't know how, but on some deep, primal level, she was aware that if this thing got its hands on her, something horrific beyond description would happen to her. She was too terrified to even move a muscle in its presence. She remained like that, standing in the shower and sobbing quietly for the next three solid hours until the creature finally disappeared. When her colleagues found her, she'd experienced moderate scalding wounds from the hot water of the shower. It took several hours for Agent Mendoza to compose herself enough to share her story. A couple days later, Tim Ellis, a junior-level filing clerk, was found trapped in a Site-41 supply closet. He'd urinated in his Foundation-issued slacks and was in a state of borderline catatonia. When his superiors asked him why he'd been spending two hours in a supply closet on company time, he reported that it was because a monster had appeared outside the door when he was searching for a replacement stapler. Despite never actually opening the door to see what was outside or call for help, Mr. Ellis said that he felt as though he would have had a heart attack if he actually opened that accursed door. He was able to provide a clear description of the monster. He said it was tall and emaciated, with reddish-brown skin that made it seem almost burnt or rotten. While it stood there and waited beyond the supply closet door, it let out the most awful wheezing noise, like an old, rusty iron lung. But the image that Ellis seemed most fixated on was the monster's face, or lack thereof. Just a huge, grinning mouth that covered up its entire head, stocked with an arsenal of massive yellow teeth. Ellis was visibly shivering as he talked about it. Two incidents are an unpleasant coincidence, but three are a bona fide pattern. And it didn't take long for more sightings of this strange new anomaly, dubbed SCP-303 or the Doorman, to pop up across the site. It earned that name by always appearing behind some kind of doorway, or at least a movable divider, in the case of Agent Mendoza's shower curtain. Whenever it appeared outside a doorway, nearby Foundation personnel would report being struck with a sudden paralyzing terror that made engaging with the creature impossible. Attempts to call for help were also often stifled, as the very presence of the doorman causes disruptions to electrical equipment. Whenever the doorman manifests in your proximity, it's safe to say that it'll be commanding your absolute, undivided attention. 
This was a particularly frightening case for the SCP Foundation, because it was one of the few anomalies bringing the fight directly to them. Most sentient anomalous beings would do anything to avoid getting captured by the SCP Foundation and contained in one of their high-security sites, full of experienced researchers and state-of-the-art equipment designed specifically to neutralize their effects. The Doorman, however, just seemed to take this as a challenge, turning even the most hardcore personnel on the site into gibbering wrecks with its mere presence. But the Doorman was just getting started. Agent Henderson had a frightening encounter in the break room. He was pulling a long shift and just wanted to grab some coffee creamer from the cabinet. However, as he approached the cabinet, he heard the telltale wheezing and that terrible, overwhelming terror set in once more. The doorman was sitting inside the cabinet in a fetal position. He just knew it. Could this thing really appear just anywhere as it pleased, and keep people in or out until it decided to dematerialize and torment somebody else? When the creature finally dematerialized and the cabinet was examined, the coffee creamer was found to be missing, leaving Agent Henderson distraught. This was the first recorded instance of the doorman stealing a physical item, but it would be far from the last. Henderson wondered whether the creature that had just humiliated him was sitting somewhere else now, sipping from a warm cup of joe with its big, freakish mouth and laughing at him. But a few incidents after this, things would become considerably more serious. The doorman was about to take its first life. Well, it isn't really that simple, if you want to get into the semantics of the thing. When the body of Dr. Barker was found inside the second floor storage room after a spree of SCP-303 incidents, the question was naturally posed as to whether the doorman had gotten more dangerous and finally directly attacked one of its victims. Not quite. There had only been one way in and out of the storage room, a secure decompression chamber and the doorman had appeared inside this chamber while Dr. Barker was in the storage room, effectively trapping him inside with the sheer terror it causes in its victims. He was trapped in the room for a grand total of five days, at which point he finally died of dehydration, and the doorman demanifested shortly afterward. The staff of Site-41 scaled up their countermeasure efforts, hoping to discover more about and perhaps even trap and contain the infamous doorman. Dr. Burroughs, Researcher Matthews, four members of security personnel, and four D-Class operatives formed a kind of strike team, ready for quick dispatches whenever the doorman happened to manifest. It wasn't long before the creature appeared in a room on the first floor, but the team quickly intercepted its location, ready and eager to gather more data on the mysterious being that had been terrorizing them all for weeks. Dr. Burroughs ordered one of the D-Classes to open the door and look inside, but the D-Class refused out of fear. The doctor told him that if he didn't open the door, he'd be transferred to SCP-682 duty. The D-Class frantically shook his head and said, I'd rather take my chances with the reptile than go in there. The doctor was getting frustrated. He told the D-Class that if he didn't open the door immediately, he'd be terminated right there on the spot. The D-Class still refused, saying that he'd take death over what the doorman would do to him if he stepped inside. Without hesitation, Dr. Burroughs ordered one of the security officers to shoot the D-Class then and there. The shot was fired. The D-Class was terminated. Dr. Burroughs then ordered a female D-Class who just witnessed this callous execution to open the door, or the same abrupt death would befall her. She still refused, then began to describe the awful things she believed the doorman would do to her if she went inside. Researcher Matthews was visibly shaken by the description. Dr. Burroughs decided not to terminate this D-Class immediately. He instead wanted to see just how much pressure the doorman's anomalous fear-based resistance mechanisms could take. Another D-Class was given a combat knife, and also given the order to cut the female D-Class with it every time she refused an order to go inside. After two hours of repeated asking from Dr. Burroughs, the female D-Class dropped dead from blood loss. At no point did she ever attempt to open the door. It seemed that in all the cases for those in the thrall of the doorman's anomalous effects, death is a truly preferable alternative to ever facing it head on. It's worth mentioning that these tests were conducted back in the 1970s, before the formation of the Foundation's Ethics Committee, which explains why their methods feel a little needlessly cruel. Since then, the doorman has fully commandeered the second floor storage room, the same one where it caused Dr. Barker's death. It only leaves the room to steal more items from around the site, 
These items have include a cryotube, three sets of standard foundation surgical equipment, two D-class research cadavers, one gasoline-powered generator, a variety of chemicals from the chemical storage areas, and, of course, poor Agent Henderson's can of powdered coffee creamer. The reason for the doorman taking an interest in these particular items remains unknown, but we can only assume that nothing good can come of it. And there you have it, folks. The strange, frightening, and eerily inconclusive tale of the doorman. All we can really say is that we're awfully glad he's fixated on bothering Site-41, because who knows what would happen if he widened his net to the rest of us. Thankfully, we won't need to think about that. Oh, that's odd. Can you hear that? I thought I was imagining it. Though come to think of it, I can't help but feel a little uneasy right now. Do you ever get that feeling that you're being watched? Wait, the door. There's something behind the door. Can you feel it? Can you feel its red flesh and rotten teeth pressing up against it, breathing, waiting? Can you feel it staring at you without eyes, looking deep into your very soul? <laughs> well, that's good. But just stay cautious, okay? After all, life has many doors, Ed Boy, and you never know who or what will be waiting for you behind the next one. It was an old factory in the middle of nowhere, long abandoned, but still standing. In the past, it had been filled with workers, but now nothing ran through it besides the occasional wildlife. One July night in 1949, though, four teenagers decided it would be a good place to explore. The entrance to the factory was a large, old-fashioned looking wooden door that was locked tightly shut. The teens looked around for another way in, but couldn't find one. What they did find, though, was an old iron lockbox. After some effort, they managed to get the box open and found a ring of 12 old rusted steel keys sitting inside. Would these old keys open the wooden door? Would they find something inside that would make their night of breaking and entering worth it? If only they knew that by unlocking the door, all they would find was true horror. Because they had just found SCP-004, better known as the 12 keys and the door. Not long after, the local sheriff received a call from three of the panicked teens. They explained that while trying to get into the factory, one of their friends had gone missing. The local authorities were quickly deployed, taking the three teens into custody and beginning a full search of the factory grounds. The searching sheriff's department officers did eventually manage to find a clue as to what happened to the missing teen, but it wasn't a good sign. It was their severed hand, and even more disturbing is that it wasn't discovered outside the factory. No, it was found over eight kilometers away. Soon, other body parts were also found, some as far as 32 kilometers away. But how could the parts of the dead teenager's body have been scattered so quickly and so far from each other? When the surviving teens were interrogated, they all repeated the same wild story. The now-dead teen had taken one of the keys out of the old box they had found and used it to unlock the strange old-fashioned wooden door that led into the factory. They opened the door and stepped inside, and the moment they did, they were immediately torn into pieces that suddenly vanished. These were no ordinary keys, and this was no ordinary door. It was clear this was a job for the SCP Foundation. An SCP agent was deployed to the site to begin investigating this anomaly. After getting the keys from local authorities, the agent brought in a group of 12 D-Class personnel to test them, one for each key. And it soon became clear that there was one effect that was common. Ten of the keys seemed to cause an effect that was completely unsurvivable. Upon trying the key in the door, the test subject was immediately torn apart just like the unfortunate teenager. While one key caused the body parts to be scattered in the immediate vicinity, all the others seemed to vanish into thin air. But it was the other two keys that proved to be of even greater interest to the Foundation. Unlike with all the other tests, the D-Class using the key designated SCP-004-7 was able to enter the door and return completely unharmed. But the D-Class using SCP-004-12 was a different story. Physically, he returned unharmed, but he seemed barely able to stagger out of the room. He collapsed and then began trying to claw his eyes out in panic and terror. He was quickly restrained and interrogated, but he wasn't coherent enough to give the Foundation any idea of what lurked behind the door. 
the first D-Class to enter using SCP-004-7, the one who returned intact and sane, only said that it was a massive room inside, far bigger than the building appeared from the outside. It was determined that the use of this key was safe enough for further testing. The door was open again using the same key, and the Foundation researchers propped it open so that an armed team could go inside and hopefully come out. A brief exploration of the massive room showed some clear anomalous properties. Not only was the room impossible to measure and possibly limitless in size, it also seemed impossible to shine any light in the room beyond the entry, and the people inside were the only objects that could be felt or illuminated. Whatever this room was, it was keeping its secrets. It was clear the site needed to be locked down. All the initial witnesses who knew too much were terminated. The Foundation was a little more trigger-happy with terminations in the 40s, and the site was quickly locked down under the auspices of being dangerous due to unexploded ordinances. Fences were placed around the site so that there would be no more teenage explorations. The records are spotty and incomplete, but whatever happened behind those doors during the initial testing between 1949 and 1950, the Foundation decided it had learned enough. The space-time anomalies at play inside of SCP-004 were deemed too dangerous to explore further, and the site was sealed off with all testing suspended. Whatever was lurking behind those doors, it would keep its secrets, and the site seemed easy to secure and contain. But this was far from the end of SCP-004, and 50 years later, it made its presence known again. It was another July night, many decades after the unfortunate teenager first opened the doors to SCP-004. Only a few pieces of their body had been found, but suddenly the rest of the corpse appeared exactly where they had last been seen, outside the old wooden door. Even odder was the fact that even though the subject had died many years ago, their body was still fresh, as if they had been killed that same day, and this wouldn't be the only sudden reappearance. Two days later, a second body missing parts appeared in front of the door. This was quickly identified as one of the original 12 test subjects who opened the door. Foundation scientists were once again sent to the site to explore the space-time anomalies and it was becoming clear that what went inside the door didn't stay there. It seemed like it went somewhere that didn't exist on this same plane as our reality. And if it could be understood, it could be used. On March 21st, 1999, the Foundation began establishing a site inside of SCP-004, but not for testing or research purposes. Nuclear weapons around the world were proliferating fast, and evidence was mounting that World War III could happen soon. The Foundation needed a site that could survive anything, and the mysterious room opened by the rusted keys seemed like it could be their salvation. Supplies would go in the room and would be preserved there indefinitely, safe from even nuclear annihilation. But getting the site set up would pose its own challenges. Now dubbed Site-62, the facility was soon expanded to house certain SCPs as well, in addition to a supercomputer to house all Foundation data. This would make it another invaluable backup in the event of an end-of-the-world event that necessitated a reboot. The site was completed over the next year, during which time they added high-tech containment units that could hold even the most dangerous SCP specimens. Entering and exiting the facility seemed to pose a risk to those working on it, though. Time no longer behaved like it should, even when using the one safe key. People would spend weeks in the site, then exit claiming they had only been there a few days. It was highly unpredictable, and the Foundation determined that it would be better to eliminate this X Factor. All personnel working at Site-62 would now live on site permanently, with their families being told that they had died in an accident. It was August 18, 2003, when the United States and Canada were hit with a massive power outage knocking out power to many of the Northeast's biggest population centers. While the SCP Foundation has backups on every site, multiple generators failed, and it was 53 minutes before power could be restored. During that time, those inside the mysterious room were plunged into total darkness, and it soon became clear they weren't alone. In the darkened room, the personnel reported feeling that they were surrounded by people that shouldn't be there, and creatures that shouldn't exist. While they couldn't see anything and nothing touched them, 
They were adamant that something was lurking in the room, and likely had been for a very long time. It seemed the limited source of light may be the only thing keeping these entities, whatever they are, at bay. When testing had resumed on SCP-004 after the bodies had reappeared outside the door, the Foundation decided to start exploring the effects of SCP-004-12 as well. What about this key caused such psychological horror that the subjects would try to tear out their own eyes? This key seemed to drive them insane, and of the 16 subjects, only four were still alive for any length of time after their return. Most remained in a catatonic state, but one was given extensive therapy and regained the ability to communicate, which allowed him to give the Foundation their best picture yet of what lurked inside the room. While the D-Class personnel was still severely affected by his time in the room and suffered near-total amnesia, he did remember a few things. He remembered deep terror and memories being forced into his mind that made no sense, as if they were artificially implanted. And he remembered not being alone. He described a massive green being, large enough that he couldn't see where it began and where it ended. The Foundation didn't know what it was either, but what they did know for certain is that when ten of these keys are used, the doors open to a dimension where the laws of physics are so different that it is completely unsurvivable. Studies are ongoing as to what makes this effect so fatal and if there is a way to survive it, but no answers have been found. And with only three bodies of victims recovered so far, there is little evidence. But one object found on site is of additional interest. Discovered roughly a year after the initial anomaly, in a manager's office on the factory grounds, SCP-004-14 seems to be a miniature version of the anomaly. It's a large box made out of wood, and it is the only other object opened by the one safe key as well as five of the other keys that lead to death when used on the main door. And this box has unusual properties as well. It opens automatically, and much like SCP-004's room, it seems to be much larger on the inside than the outside. It is possible to come in and out safely, but once the box is locked again, it is a different story. Objects placed in the box don't seem to affect its weight, and when the box is closed and locked, they vanish completely. Unlike the main room, nothing that's gone inside and locked in has ever been recovered. This includes living beings. Few answers have been found out about where they go, and it's possible the box could be used to dispose of specimens deemed to be too dangerous. But with no answers about where they go and when they might come back, this may be too risky. Because SCP-004 is fixed in place, Special containment procedures focus on making sure it stays that way. It is strictly forbidden to take any of the other keys through the door, for fear of losing them or causing it to react in an unpredictable way. If the site should be breached, or anything contained in Site-62 manages to escape containment, the Foundation is ready to activate the on-site warhead. Only employees with Level 1 clearance can access the site, and only Level 4s and above can use the keys with all knowing that any attempt to remove the keys from the site will result in immediate termination. For now, SCP-004 remains fenced off, with only select experiments continuing, as the Foundation tries to unravel its mysteries. But whatever lurks behind that wooden door, it keeps its secrets well. The SCP Foundation contains a lot of monsters. From SCP-682, the lizard that refuses to die, to SCP-939, a species of pack hunters that steal the voices of their victims. The dangerous predators that occupy the hundreds of containment cells of the Foundation make it their job to hunt and kill innocent people, or worse. But have you ever wondered where some of those monsters come from? The first encounter that the SCP Foundation had with SCP-4049 was on July 14th of 2010. The Foundation operates a massive surveillance network around the entire world through the use of AI, delegated duties, and compartmentalized information. They're able to have 911 operators report any calls that seem anomalous in nature while knowing nothing about the Foundation itself. This way, 
They're able to constantly be aware of anything anomalous going on in the country that gets reported to 911. On July 14th, the Foundation was alerted of a call that likely had an anomalous component. At first, it didn't seem like much. It was a remote address in Wyoming, outside of a small town called Gardnerville, the vacation home of one Richard Sampson, a wealthy businessman in the area, placed right on the slopes. The call was made late in the afternoon, by someone purporting to be the groundskeeper of the home while Mr. Sampson was away. He was screaming into the phone, terrified and largely incoherent, but the operator made out something about a monster attacking the house. There was a lot of noise in the background, sounds of shouting, destruction, and what sounded like animalistic roars and grunts. The 911 operator moved the call up, and it didn't take long for the Foundation to determine that something strange was going on here. They dispatched a handful of agents, deep undercover as officers with the Wyoming Highway Patrol, to the address of the home where the call had come from. After about half an hour, the agents called back into HQ. The scene they had found was nothing short of gruesome. Upon arrival, they were greeted with what appeared to be the aftermath of a particularly violent and brief tornado. The entire front section of the ground floor had been shredded, the gardens trampled, and the interior utterly destroyed. The agents picked their way between the wreckage of the home. It functionally didn't exist anymore. The walls were collapsed from being rammed and torn through, and the roof had collapsed in on itself. The broken shards and pieces of furniture and wreckage were everywhere. Despite appearances, this wasn't a tornado. A tornado would have thrown the entire house around. No, this was, as the groundskeeper had said, something alive, monstrous, and very angry. Speaking of the groundskeeper, the Foundation agents began to look for him once they took stock of the damage of the home. At first, they couldn't find him among the massive pieces of debris and assume the worst. Even if whatever had destroyed the house decided to not kill him, he could easily have been killed by the collapsing house buried under rubble, or a dozen other things. They picked through the ruins, calling out that they were from the police and were here to help. Eventually, after another half hour of searching, they heard something. What sounded like crying and whispering became audible as the wind died down. The agents honed in on the noise and found it was coming from one of the larger piles of rubble. After getting some equipment, they were able to heft up the piece of the collapsed roof and found the groundskeeper underneath curled into a ball and talking to himself. He seemed to be in some kind of panicked fugue state, not responding to the agents trying to get through to him. They wrapped him in a shock blanket and put him in the back of one of their patrol cars. But even after that, they couldn't get anything of use out of him. He was just shaking and muttering something about monsters. Eventually, he was given amnestics to forget about the incident entirely and recovered. After the agents reported back to HQ, a new issue popped up. They weren't the only ones who knew about this. A news website a few counties away had the story. The Foundation quickly put out a cover story. The house had probably been destroyed by a group of grizzly bears, possibly rabid. They had the local government issue a warning advising local residents to stay inside and out of the wilderness until the animals could be tracked and euthanized. And that's exactly what the Foundation did. Mobile Task Force Epsilon 6, The Village Idiots, an MTF that specializes in taking on anomalous threats in remote, rural areas and small towns, were dispatched to track and contain or terminate whatever had destroyed that mansion. The creature had left a strong trail of tracks, scent, and general destruction, and the troopers followed it north for hours into another dense forest, where they discovered the gigantic, hulking creature while it was asleep and shot it. It was huge with rippling muscles on all four legs and no fur to speak of. But the most striking feature was a frighteningly human face. The agents resolved to let the researchers handle the autopsy and busied themselves with the other things in that forest. There was an old abandoned arms factory that the creature seemed to have come from. The agents descended into the decrepit abandoned building, following the creature's trail right into the basement. There they found a large steel door, and behind it, the anomaly that would eventually be called SCP-4049. It was strange. It seemed to be some kind of massive, empty room looking up into the sky, even though they were deep underground. Not entirely empty. The dirt ground had a series of concentric rings of gravestones in it, 
all facing inward. The agents were treated once they realized they had walked into a spatial anomaly and called for backup. The Foundation quickly flew in researchers and a containment team to figure out what the anomaly was, and to ensure no one else got into the factory while they figured that out. The basement of the factory became a sort of base of operations for the large crew of research and security personnel assigned to SCP-4049. After making sure there were no other of the monsters, designated SCP-4049-1 instances in the nearby forest, the researchers began to experiment on it. They determined that the room on the other side of the hallway was in an extra-dimensional space. Members of D-Class personnel were sent in with GPS trackers, and even though they could still be heard fine on the radio, the GPS trackers failed totally. Obviously, the fact that you could see the sky from an underground room was anomalous, but attempts to dig into where the room should have been from the surface also led to nothing but more dirt. From inside, the D-Class were able to give a detailed report on the room as they walked around. It was perfectly circular and pretty large, about 30 feet across, give or take. A tall white wall ringed the room's border and was perfectly smooth and impossible to get a grip on enough to climb. Cold, hard, marble. The floor of the room wasn't marble, though. It seemed to be regular dirt. The D-Classes were ordered by researchers to get samples of what they could and they scooped a little dirt into sample bags. But as soon as the subject stepped back over the threshold into the corridor of SCP-4049, the sample bags they collected spontaneously combusted, going up in flames. Any chemical analysis of its composition was, of course, impossible. The researchers resolved to get what information they could of just looking at SCP-4049 first, and there was still a lot to look at. The D-Class inspected the rings of gravestones inside SCP-4049. There were just two at the moment. A larger ring contained a smaller ring. Inside the smaller ring, there was a circular empty space a few feet wide. Most of the graves were unfilled and unmarked. Just a patch of dirt turned over, but about a dozen of them had a gravestone at their head, made of that same white marble substance the walls were made from. They weren't fancy, just a simple white rectangle stamped with some strange symbols. The D-Class took photos and sent them to the researchers, who recognized the markings as an ancient word in Greek, hound. The researchers were admittedly baffled by what this could mean for SCP-4049, but decided to figure out the connection using the evidence they had the corpse of the SCP-4049-1 instance. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. The researchers placed the huge corpse inside the factory, creating a secure space to perform the autopsy. Then a team of doctors began cutting into it with scalpels, or they tried anyway. They quickly realized that the skin of the creature was far too thick to be breached with scalpels, and resorted to long, sharpened knives. They discovered quite a few things about the instance's anatomy, along with why and how it was able to do and absorb so much damage. It was a quadruped, walking on four limbs. The forward one seemed to be in the shape of arms with elbows and wrists, but also had clawed paws like a dog's. The back legs were thick and heavily muscled, and digitigrade, again, just like a dog, so they could be used to leap and jump great distances. Once they cut away the skin, the researchers noticed that it was indeed much thicker than they expected it to be. Human skin is only about two millimeters thick, but this was a full centimeter throughout, as well as incredibly tough and gamey. Internally, the structure was all wrong. It seemed almost human-like, but with a few key differences to suit the vastly changed exterior body. The spine was much thicker and wider, as well as being curved to fit the four-legged structure. There seemed to be redundant organs. The researchers theorized they were backups, like the secondary heart they found inside the creature's innards. It could serve as a backup if the main heart stopped working or was damaged, or it could work together with the main heart to improve the instance's performance during physical activity. There didn't seem to be any kind of reproductive system. It wasn't surgically removed, it just wasn't there at all, like it had magically disappeared. And inside the thing's head, the skull was different. The mouth was much wider and larger, and it didn't take long for the researchers to figure out why. When rooting around in its mouth, they quickly discovered it had an extra set of sharp teeth behind its main set. All unnerving, slightly disturbing discoveries, but the most frightening wasn't something they found inside the instance, 
It was something they noticed immediately upon containing it. Its face was human. It had been morphed, of course, to fit the altered skull, but there were two eyes, a forehead, a nose, lips. It was inarguably a human face. While the researchers sent for a DNA test, they were disturbed but not surprised to discover what they had already been expecting. The instance was entirely genetically human, not a changed species or a close relative. This creature had once been a regular human being, like you or I. The researchers had just sent the DNA sample off to check if there was a match in the criminal database, when suddenly the lights went red, the doors sealed, and the site's alarms began to sound. At that moment, the steel door leading to SCP-4049 flung open, and another SCP-4049-1 instance bounded out into the corridor on all fours. It set its beady eyes on three members of the mobile task force, standing on the far side of the long corridor. For a moment, it didn't do anything, and it let out a long screech that echoed around the entire factory. Its rear legs tensed up, and it began to bound down the hallway toward them. All of the security guards opened fire with their machine guns on the anomaly, trying to bring it down. It shrugged off the bullets like they were raindrops and didn't so much as slow down. Meanwhile, the two dozen other security personnel in the facility were rapidly grabbing their weapons and armor from their lockers before rocketing down the stairs to the corridor. By the time they made it down, it was too late. The instance was using its claws and jaws to tear two of the three poor members of the task force to shreds. It wasn't eating them, but it was attacking them with enough anger and malice that there wasn't going to be much left when it was done. The third member of the task force had fallen and was backing away from the anomaly in fear. The remaining members of the task force opened fire, smothering the SCP-4049-1 instance in a hail of bullets. The sudden overwhelming firepower caught it off guard, and after a few seconds of sustained gunfire, it fell to the ground, dead. Once the Foundation realized the active danger that SCP-4049 presented, they decided not to take any chances with containment. The 50-meter-long corridor leading to SCP-4049 from the basement elevator was fortified. An airlock was installed on the far side separating it from the rest of the factory. Then, motion detectors were set every few meters throughout the hallway, attached to a series of deterrents. If an SCP-4049-1 instance smashed out of the steel door, it would trip the alarms and activate everything from a supersonic sound cannon to sentry guns and a machine gun emplacement. And if none of those worked, the entire corridor could be pumped full of nerve gas guaranteeing the death of the instance without risking the lives of any personnel. This kill corridor was to be guarded by the Applied Task Force IOTA-9 to ensure that no SCP-4049-1 instance would survive its escape. But after the corridor was retrofitted, the Foundation had a bigger problem. Where were these SCP-4049-1 instances coming from to begin with? They performed another DNA test on the new instance. Its face was different so it seemed logical that it was a different person. When the results came back, the researchers were surprised to find that not just one, but both of the samples had DNA matches in the national database. Both were men from the tri-state area who had mysteriously died or disappeared in the past few months, while at some kind of religious service. They were both avid big game hunters, with an interest in shooting moose, bears, and elk. And most important, they had both been the subject of a fire-related incident. One had been presumed dead when his house burned down. The other had simply vanished, with his car being found hours later on fire by the side of the highway. In both cases, a body was never recovered, but the authorities did find a strange stone-tipped arrow driven into the ground nearby. Over the following months, the Foundation observed a number of these strange events happening in Wyoming, Idaho, and Montana, and like clockwork, Every time it happened, a new headstone appeared over one of the previously unmarked graves inside SCP-4049, saying the same Greek word, Hound. On top of all of that, almost every time a man in the area disappeared under these specific circumstances and a grave was created, an SCP-4049-1 instance would appear inside SCP-4049 sometime in the following two months buried within the soil circle in the center of the room. It would claw its way out of the dirt, smash open the steel door to SCP-4049, and race down the hallway trying to kill and destroy whatever was in front of it until it was gunned down. But in one instance, that didn't happen. On September 17th of 2015, 
The Foundation had gotten into the rhythm of containing SCP-4049, so they weren't startled or caught off guard when an agent with the Highway Patrol reported finding a flaming truck near a hunting ground. In the bed was an elk carcass, with a stone-tipped arrow lodged deep into the meat. Applied Task Force IOTA-9 at the factory began to prepare for an imminent appearance from an SCP-4049-1 entity within the following weeks, and established a round-the-clock guard in the kill corridor. But it never came. By December, nothing had happened at all. The Foundation made the decision. A D-Class would be sent into SCP-4049 with a camera and radio, in the hopes of manually initiating the event to occur. The D-Class subject wasn't given very specific instructions, just fitted with a body camera, a two-way radio, and told to listen to all instructions on the headset. The researchers ordered him forward, until he reached the other side of the hallway, where he was to open the steel door leading to SCP-4049 and enter. When he entered, everything looked the same as the Foundation expected it to. The same gravestones, walls, and dirt. He moved towards the center of the room to the dirt circle, but suddenly stopped, looking around. When the researchers asked why, he reported hearing the sound of dogs barking for a moment, before the researchers told him to keep walking. When he stopped in the center of the room, he again radioed in, feeling that someone was there. The camera didn't pick anyone up, but he insisted that there was an odd feeling, just before the audio stream suddenly cut out. A burst of static interference drowned everything else out, and was slowly winded down. The D-Class couldn't be heard anymore, but a strange female voice was on the line speaking to the Foundation. She mentioned that the Foundation had been ruining her pets for far too long. The Foundation demanded the speaker identify themselves, but she just scoffed, indignant at what she called human arrogance. Right after that, all audio feeds were cut out permanently. This mysterious woman was designated as SCP-4049-2. Seven seconds after they cut out, the largest SCP-4049-1 instance ever recorded exited SCP-4049, standing at almost 11 meters high. All of the deterrents were activated, but even then, it still took all of them combined with machine gun fire from the applied task force to bring the creature down. No remains of the D-Class and no traces of whoever was speaking on the radio were ever found by the researchers. It can be dangerous to stand between someone and their beloved pets. Did you ever have to perform a dissection in school? Maybe you had to carve up a fetal pig, or slice into a frog while nightmarish visions of Kermit and a widowed Miss Piggy danced in your head. Though it's rarely a pleasant experience, unless your tastes are on the morbid side, most biology teachers would agree that the best way to learn how something works is to take it apart. As distasteful as it can be to hold a frog's tiny liver in your hands, it definitely does give you a better sense of the pieces that make up the complete creature. But what if there was an easier way to look at the individual parts of a living being? What if you could take it apart without ever having to prep a scalpel or stain your hands with the blood of innocent frogs? Like most of the seemingly impossible things in our world, the SCP Foundation discovered something that allows its users to do just that. In fact, it can handle a lot more than just a frog, and its applications go far beyond the confines of a high school science lab. SCP-291 is a small, plain steel building with a large door on one side. The door has no handle or knob and functions similarly to a garage door. The door cannot be pried open by any ordinary means, and the inside of SCP-291 can only be accessed if the structure is connected to a suitable power source. Once a power source has been connected, the door races and exposes a room inside. It is small, about 4 by 2 meters. It contains a console board, a large screen, and a plexiglass container resembling a coffin. How very sinister. The coffin is large enough to contain a human under 7 feet tall. So sorry, Ferdinand the Cannibal, you're going to need to sit this one out. The coffin sits on a conveyor belt with several tubes connected to the wall above it. On the opposite side of the room, there are holes of varying sizes, each containing a small door that can be opened or closed. Because initial observation indicated that SCP-291 was intended for some kind of human testing, a D-Class test subject was selected for experimentation. The subject was instructed to lie down in the coffin and wait to see what would happen next. The display screen lit up, depicting a grid-lined image of the test subject. 
Buttons along the console board adjusted the image, showing the skin, muscles, and organ systems of the person in the coffin. There were no words or numbers on the screen, and all of the buttons appeared to have only two settings, on and off. When one of the researchers pressed the first button on the console, the tubes above the coffin began pouring a blue liquid into it. The test subject reacted with confusion, but did not experience any adverse effects. They quickly lost consciousness, indicating that the liquid was some sort of sedative. The liquid continued to pour into the coffin until the vessel was completely filled, at which point it congealed into a thick gel. The test subject's breathing and heartbeat slowed to a stop, and the conveyor belt suddenly creaked to life. The coffin was carried, test subject inside, through a small door that immediately locked behind it. The small room was filled with the sounds of gears turning, machinery clinking, and motors whirring. The display screen was taken over by a large rectangle, resembling a traditional loading screen. After 30 minutes, the process was complete, and the back door of the room unlocked itself. When the researcher walked through the back door, they found another room with a conveyor belt and a row of two dozen lockers. Each locker was opened, one at a time, and its contents removed for examination. Inside each, the research team found a different portion of the test subject's body in a block of some unidentified clear substance. The body was divided in the lockers into these separate parts. Brain, lungs, and diaphragm, heart, digestive system, reproductive organs, left eye, right eye, upper left torso and arm, upper right torso and arm, lower left torso and upper leg, lower right torso and upper leg, lower left leg and foot, lower right leg and foot, lower left arm and hand, lower right arm and hand, neck and head, upper skeletal system, lower skeletal system, lymphatic and circulatory system, and skin. Phew, the miracle of the human body, right? boundless in its fascinating complexities. Each block of body parts was placed back in its designated locker, and the second button on the console was pressed. At this point, the doors to the organ lockers sealed themselves shut, and the sound of the machinery working filled the small space once again. This continued for a duration of approximately 45 minutes. When the machinery went silent, a new plexiglass coffin emerged into the main room, with the test subject inside. He looked identical to how he had looked at the start of the experiment, with no evidence that he had previously been disassembled. The blue liquid slowly evaporated from the container, and the test subject opened his eyes. The lead researcher conducted an immediate interview with the reassembled subject, who reported no memory of the process after initial exposure to the blue liquid. They insisted that the process had been like a good night's sleep, which honestly makes us pretty eager to take it for a spin. A medical examination determined that there were only a few changes to the test subject during the disassembly and reassembly. When they returned to consciousness, the test subject's stomach was empty, they were naked, and all of their hair was gone. With this new understanding of SCP-291's anomalous properties, the Foundation decided to continue their experimentation. With each new test, the experiments became more creative and, unsurprisingly, more depraved. First, a D-class subject was placed in the coffin and disassembled. Then, instead of placing the various body parts in their designated lockers, the vital organs were removed from their storage before reassembly was attempted. This resulted in the equipment shutting down completely. A researcher pressed the third button, which forced a hard reset of the entire process, causing all of the blocks of body parts to eject via an exit hatch. During the next experiment, non-vital organs were removed before the subject's body was reassembled. The appendix and gallbladder were left out, and when the subject regained consciousness, these organs were still gone. However, there was no visible damage or scar tissue in their place. They were simply gone, as if they had never been there in the first place. So, if body parts could be removed from a test subject, could new body parts be added? Could existing body parts be replaced with different ones? A D-class subject in need of a skin graft following a flamethrower-based accident was placed in SCP-291. Once taken apart, a portion of healthy skin donated by another, somewhat unwilling D-class subject was placed in the locker, along with the skin already present there. Once the subject was put back together, the healthy skin had replaced the damaged skin with no adverse effects. Repeat attempts at this test showed that it was effective for limb transplants, heart transplants, and kidney transplants with a 0% failure rate across all tests. After determining that SCP-291 could be used for an untold amount of good, making organ donations easier and safer than ever, the Foundation naturally had to pivot to something more useless but interesting and likely horrifying. After all, 
It's not like they could ever just make anomalous technology available to the public, right? Two D-Class subjects, one man and one woman, were disassembled by SCP-291. The brains of the test subjects were swapped, and then they were reassembled. When they awoke, the subjects had the personalities and memories of the brain placed in their body. In a turn of events previously only seen in blockbuster comedies like Freaky Friday and the live-action Scooby-Doo movie, seminal piece of cinema, the subjects had swapped bodies. They were subsequently disassembled. Their request to look at their new bodies naked having been swiftly denied, and the brains were returned to their rightful bodies. After the experiment was finished, the subjects appeared mostly normal. However, they did complain of disorientation as well as mental and physical discomfort over the next several days. After going through two brain transplants in one day, though, that's really the least you can expect. After perfecting the practice of swapping body parts between different human subjects, the ghoulishly curious research team decided to take things in an interspecies direction. A variety of test subjects, including cats, dogs, lizards, fish, mice, and, of course, humans, were selected for this next round of experiments. Twenty tests were performed using these new subjects, and only three of the experiments were successful in transferring body parts from an animal of one species to another animal of a different one. Attempts to swap body parts between mammals and reptiles or fish proved disastrous. When a fish and a human were both disassembled and the fish's gills were placed with the human's body parts, neither creature survived the reassembly process. The human awoke with a new set of gills embedded in their neck and immediately began gasping for the oxygen they could not take in. Within minutes, they had suffocated. The fish's fate was even worse. It did not reassemble so much as it became a pile of goo, scales, and two floating eyeballs. Experimentation with a human and a lizard yielded similar results, turning the lizard into a puddle of organic matter and killing the human test subject after only a few minutes. As disastrous as the failed cross-species tests were, the successful ones were almost as bad. Trial 001 involved a cat and a human. Not wanting to attempt too much at once, the research team opted to just swap out one organ, the left eye. Both subjects survived the transfer and were able to use their new eye. The human subject reported full use of the cat's eye, with improved night vision in addition to trouble seeing color. The cat did not enjoy its new eye nearly as much as the human subject, and had clawed its human eye out of its head by the end of the following week. In Trial 007, a successful brain transfer was performed between an adult human man and an English Mastiff. The man in the Mastiff's body expressed discomfort with walking on all fours and asked to be returned to his body as soon as possible. The Mastiff in the man's body adjusted to bipedal locomotion in a few hours, but was disassembled after urinating on a researcher's shoes. The final successful trial, and the most unnerving, was Trial 016. A female D-class test subject's reproductive organs were swapped with those of a pregnant Labrador retriever. An ultrasound conducted after the transfer indicated that the Labrador fetuses survived the procedure and could conceivably be carried to term by the human subject. Several members of the research team began to take bets on whether or not she would end up giving birth to puppies, but the transfer was reversed within the day. So we'll never know what exactly would have happened. Perhaps that's for the best. Personally, we hope the Foundation's Ethics Committee gives some of these scientists a very stern talking to about their behavior on this one. When not in use for testing, SCP-291 is to be disconnected from any power sources. At least two personnel are positioned outside of its containment at all times, standing guard, and these personnel must be swapped out every week. When it is not connected to any power sources, SCP-291 is considered harmless, though it should still be treated with caution. The main entryway remains closed and locked when there is no available power source, but the door can be opened manually from the inside in the event of an emergency. Any disassembled organisms are stored in a locker in the containment facility, labeled with a Sharpie marker in order to keep track of what specimens are stored there. Whether this is the same Sharpie used to label food in the break room fridge is unknown, but just like Dr. De Ramiro's ham sandwich, it's best to leave these items untouched. Any personnel found to be responsible for missing specimens will be transferred to another project and receive a strongly worded email. Hey, do you have a favorite reality show? Oh, come on, don't lie, everyone has one. Dr. Clef loves some American Ninja Warrior, and I've got it on good authority that Dr. Bright can't get enough of The Bachelor. 
So how about you, huh? Do you obsessively follow the romantic highs and lows of Love Island? Or are you more of the type who likes to curl up with a mug of hot cocoa and enjoy a nice, wholesome episode of The Great British Baking Show? Do you ever yell at the TV when the contestants on Jeopardy just can't get the answer right? Do you get a kick out of seeing what crazy collectibles will show up on this week's episode of Pawn Stars? If you answered yes to any of these, you're not alone. Millions of people around the world still tune in to all kinds of reality TV. Personally, I just can't get enough of my favorite hidden camera show, Laugh is Fun. What's that? You've never heard of Laugh is Fun? No. <laughs> oh boy, you're really missing out. If you like reality TV, you're going to love Laugh is Fun. Laugh is Fun, also known as SCP-2030, isn't a show that you can watch on TV. Instead, it appears as the most popular form of media distribution in the current year. Today, you can find it on file sharing and streaming websites. But in the 2000s, you could rent it from the DVD kiosk at the mall. And back in the 90s, it used to show up as multi-tape sets in video rental stores. Even though the SCP Foundation has only been aware of Laugh is Fun since 1993, it has a recorded 38 seasons as of 2014, meaning that it may have existed in some form as far back as the 1970s. If you want to binge all 38 seasons, you might also want to look it up under the names Laugh is Life or in some countries, Laugh is Laugh. And if you happen to be in a country where Laugh is Laugh isn't available, you may want to try changing your location using a VPN to one where you can access it. Oh, what's that? You don't have a VPN service? Well then, I'm glad you're here. Because before we go any further, I have a very important word from our sponsor, who just so happens to be NordVPN. The preferred VPN service of all the researchers here at SCP Explained. Sign up now at nordvpn.com forward slash SCP Explained. NordVPN isn't just a VPN, it's truly the best VPN available. With a simple click, you'll be able to access content that might be blocked just because of your location, so you'll never have to miss an episode of your favorite anomalous television programs. But wait, there's more, much, much more. What if you're right in the middle of binge-watching of season 31 when suddenly your quality dips to looking like a couple of blurry blocks are fighting over an old shoebox? Never fear, because NordVPN encrypts all of your traffic. That means your internet service provider can't throttle your service and slow down your streaming speed. You should never settle for less than the highest quality pixels, after all. And it doesn't matter how you choose to watch. NordVPN is available on every modern platform, including Windows, iOS, Android, macOS, Linux, and even Android TV. The monthly cost is the same as a cup of coffee. Regular coffee, that is, not the kind that comes from SCP-294. And if you sign up by going to nordvpn.com forward slash SCP Explained, you'll even get a free month. So go try it for yourself right now. That's nordvpn.com forward slash SCP Explained. Now, back to your regularly scheduled programming. As we were saying, Laugh is Fun is a prank show that puts unknowing everyday people into ridiculous scenarios and films their reactions. Each episode is about 10 to 12 minutes long and features an opening and closing monologue from beloved, supposedly human TV presenter Laffy McLafferson, aka SCP-2030-1. You've probably seen him before. He's never seen without his blue three-piece suit and black wingtip shoes. Funniest guy on TV, seriously. I think he should replace James Corden on The Late Late Show, and maybe even take up hosting a gig on SNL, if he's still got time after. He had this amazing monologue at the end of an episode in season 32. Ha <laughs> ha, what a ride, huh, folks? We've seen printers that eat, eaters that print, and everything in between. Makes you appreciate the old clunker you have at the back office, doesn't it? No, printers may not always work when you want or need them to, but they sure make for some excellent comedy. And that's what we're all about here. Comedy. We're here to make you laugh. We hope you laughed. Thank you for laughing with us. That's what we're about here, doesn't it, folks? Come laugh with us again next time. And remember, laugh is fun. Good night and laugh and laugh. Just laugh. We love the make laugh. Make more for laughter so as to for laugh. Laugh with us. 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 Laugh, laugh, laugh. Laugh and let us in. Hmm. I couldn't tell you what his face looks like, though, because he's always framed from the neck down. Once the pranks are done for the episode, he'll step up on that bright yellow stage and deliver his closing monologue. 
which always ends with a pan over the audience as everyone chants, laugh with us. Then the show always just cuts to black. The closest thing the show ever has to credits is a title card that says, filmed in front of a studio audience in partnership with YWTGTHFT. For a show that doesn't advertise or even air on TV, Laugh is Fun is still a beloved classic, and when you watch it, it's easy to see why it's been around so long. Laffy and the team pull off some really classic pranks on Laugh is Laugh. There's this one episode in season 13 where an unsuspecting family is sitting down to dinner, father starts choking and the family reacts with horror until suddenly a pair of slits appear in the father's neck allowing him to breathe. Those slits soon become nostrils and before you know it a full second head grows out of his neck. That head then grows its own neck, which grows a noose, then a face, then another head, then another neck. This keeps happening a total of 18 times while the rest of the family looks on in horror. But don't worry, before things go too far, Laffy pops out from under the table and tells the family they're on Laugh is Fun. Laffy points out the cameras and the whole family starts laughing, including all 18 of the father's heads. There's also another great season 13 episode called Squirrels. Oh man, okay, this one had me in stitches. Alright, so there's this couple lying in bed, and the wife wakes up because she hears this squeaking noise. She taps her husband on the shoulder to wake him up, but she draws her hand back in horror because she can feel something moving under her husband's skin. So before she can ask if he's okay, BOOM! Hundreds of squirrels explode out of his skin and start running around the room while the wife screams. Then Laffy walks in and turns the lights on, accompanied by the husband who is perfectly okay, even though he's been skinned from head to toe. Everyone laughs! Alright, then there's the most recent episode from season 24 called Swelling. There's this old lady sitting on a park bench feeding the pigeons and a couple walks past her. When they walk past, the old lady gets swarmed by the pigeons she's feeding. The pigeons force themselves into her mouth and keep swarming until her stomach cavity bursts open. The couple, who gets sprayed with guts as the, all the pigeons fly off, are extremely distressed by this until Laffy shows up. Some people say that this episode is too similar to Squirrels and that the show was starting to get stale at this point, but I think the joke is unique enough to stand on its own. Plus, with a prank show as long-running as Laugh, it's inevitable that you're gonna see some jokes get reused. Really, it's not about the prank itself, it's about the reactions of the people, which are always priceless. And man, the way that Laffy McLafferson comes into the frame by climbing out of the old lady's open ribcage, I was rolling on the floor. Ah, oh, you don't think the old animals exploding out of people bit is funny? Uh, okay, that's fair enough. Uh, let me think. What are some of my other favorite episodes of Laugh is Fun? Oh, yes! The Margaret Thatcher episode from season 21. That's another great thing about Laugh is Fun. It's not afraid to get a little political. So, this woman walks into her kitchen and opens the cabinet, but instead of the food being in there, it's just a big blob of flesh. The flesh blob rolls out onto the counter and morphs into a misshapen caricature of Margaret Thatcher with a disproportionately big head. The woman starts screaming, but the Thatcher creature jumps onto her, pinning her down and shoving its tongue into her mouth. The deeper the tongue goes, the more Margaret Thatcher faces start appearing all over the woman's skin. All the faces start reciting Thatcher's April 1986 speech on the bombing of Libya in perfect unison. You might watch it and think the woman's going to choke based on how long the creature's tongue is down her throat, but good old Laffy comes in and the studio audience goes nuts. Laffy points out to the cameras and says, You're on Laugh is Fun! and the woman starts laughing too with the creature's tongue still in her mouth. But I think my favorite prank I've ever seen on Laugh is Fun was the one from season 37. So, it's in a hospital. There's a woman getting a C-section and all the doctors are gathered around. One of the doctors makes a comment on how much hair the baby has, and then he screams and drops his surgical tools. The rest of the team all start screaming as well, and then, this is where it gets really funny, you see Ryan Seacrest's head pop up from out of the woman. <laughs> Okay, so this is causing her a lot of pain, obviously, so she starts screaming and crying as the Ryan Seacrest head fully emerges, at which point you can tell that its head is on an octopus body. Classic bait and switch, right? But that's not the end. The Ryan Seacrest octopus starts singing Row, Row, Row Your Boat as it emerges, and then three more octopi with celebrities' heads come out of this woman. There's one that looks like Jack Nicholson, one that looks like Johnny Cash, and one who looks like Martin Freeman. And when they've all come out of her, they start singing together in four-part harmony. It's hilarious. Laffy walks in to point out the cameras, and all the doctors start laughing. Even the woman on the operating table is laughing. In fact, she laughs so hard she passes out. It's a real shame that there are never any end credits, because it would be so cool to find out more about the people who make this show. I mean, they're total comedic geniuses, and special effects wizards too. I couldn't even guess how they do some of those pranks. But sadly, there's very little information about the show online, and you can't even ask the victims of the pranks about it, because all of them are dead. What? No, 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 not because of Laugh is Fun, that's just a prank show, it's all jokes. 
They always show everyone laughing and perfectly okay at the end, no matter how badly they got mutilated in the episode. You can even see some people who have been on previous episodes among the studio audiences if you look hard enough. But, okay, by total coincidence, everyone who is featured on Laugh is Fun eventually dies or is already dead of totally unrelated causes. Like the Terman family. Dad Gary Terman was the one who had 18 extra heads grow out of his neck. Gary, his wife Lindsay, and their two kids tragically passed away in a car wreck on the 28th of April 1989. Melissa and Travis Younglin, the couple from the Squirrel Prank, went missing and were last seen on the 12th of May 1989. The couple from the Pigeon Prank, Macy Gershon and Kyle Parker, were both killed by a hit-and-run driver in September of 2000. Doris Carter, the woman from the Thatcher Prank, passed away from ovarian cancer in 1997. And Rebecca Nash, the woman who gave birth to all those singing celebrity cephalopods, died in childbirth in 2013. You might think that the last one had something to do with her Laugh is Fun episode due to the hospital connection, but the surgeons present when she died didn't report anything strange happening at the time. All of these deaths happen in roughly the same years that all these people had their appearances on Laugh, but it's because it's only available on streaming and video. It can't really be said what the connection is since there aren't any air dates for any of the episodes. While you might assume that these people died after their appearances on Laugh and the show is actually some kind of death curse, it's just as likely that they died before, and Laugh is Fun is somehow filmed and distributed from the great beyond. Some people even think that the people who film Laugh actually kidnap all the people who appear on the show and fake their deaths in some kind of big sinister conspiracy. Sure, I have heard that all of the people who supposedly died after being on the show have inconsistencies in their death records, and that many of their graves actually just hold empty coffins, but still, that feels totally unrealistic to me. I mean, come on, can you really picture TV's own Laffy Lafferson kidnapping anyone? He has such a friendly attitude. Like I said before, no information whatsoever exists about the way this show is made. Not even the SCP Foundation has any answers. They're still actively investigating the ways in which people get chosen to be on Laugh is Fun, as well as where it's filmed and who produces it. Talk about a really niche cult hit. I hope I've sold you on Laugh is Fun. It may not be that well known, and you might have trouble finding it. But trust me, it's the funniest prank show you'll probably ever watch. I guarantee once you get into it, it'll make you laugh and laugh and laugh. Laugh with us. Laugh with us. Laugh with us. Laugh with us. On April 16th, 1999, the Raleigh Ripper was finally brought to justice after a reign of terror across the state of North Carolina that left 14 women dead. The killer's true identity had been Kevin Gruber, a local gas station attendant originally from West Virginia who was arrested at work in the early hours of the morning. His face was plastered all over the media when he was cuffed and dragged in to be questioned and processed. Like many serial killers, the most frightening thing about Kevin was the fact that he just seemed so… normal. The idea that a person like this could have committed the atrocities of the Raleigh Ripper raised a frightening question we all need to contend with. What turns a person into a monster? This question was particularly prescient for Dr. James Whittington, a criminal psychologist tasked with conducting the first official psychological evaluation on Gruber. Ever since the true identity of the killer had come to light, the case had held a particular fascination for him, mainly because Gruber the man and Gruber the killer seemed to almost be two entirely separate people. According to all evidence, the Raleigh Ripper was an insidious, methodical criminal genius. He'd stalk some of his victims, all women who lived alone for weeks before striking, conducting detailed surveillance of their homes that allowed him to isolate them, bypass their security systems, and remove any means of getting help. He blocked doors, cut phone lines, and always selected vulnerable targets. Despite being a seasoned criminal psychologist, the actual details of Gruber's crimes had kept Whittington awake at night. He had a wife and a young son at home, and the thought of a man like Gruber prowling out there made him fear for both of them. This was no thrill killer. He was a sadistic torturer who seemed to delight in the pain and terror of his prey. He'd chosen victims he could take his time with, infiltrated their homes like a gust of cold air through an open window, and slipped out through darkness like a shadow. Perfectly controlled crime scenes, no stray evidence, nothing but death left behind. For months, he'd run circles around the police, 
thousands of people who fit the Raleigh Ripper profile were interviewed. Sting operations were conducted. Communities formed neighborhood watches to keep each other safe from the killer's next move. And none of it did any good. From seasoned detectives to legions of beat cops, nobody could get the jump on Kevin Gruber. The fact he was even caught came out of pure chance. A local hiker, Mike Fletcher, just so happened to hear the screaming coming from a nearby home in the woods and made the heroic decision to run in and intervene. When he walked in on Gruber committing the attack, the killer panicked and fled through an open window. In his haste, he left a partial print on the window frame. That, combined with Mike's description of the assailant, was enough to finally link Kevin to the 14 murders of the Raleigh Ripper. The problem, from Dr. Whittington's perspective, was that by all accounts, Kevin Gruber seemed to be an idiot. This was no suave, charismatic Ted Bundy type. In all the prior photos and interviews, Kevin had that deer-in-the-headlights look of a man who's just in way over his head. Dr. Whittington had also pored over Kevin's school records. The only thing he seemed to excel at was being mediocre. He even got held back a year in fifth grade. Since graduating high school, he'd been kicked out by his parents for freeloading and hadn't been able to consistently hold down a job for more than eight months. His only prior criminal convictions had been one drunk and disorderly conduct charge and possession of an ounce of pot back in 1991, for which he got a suspended sentence due to being a minor at the time. It just didn't make sense to Dr. Whittington that this man and the diabolically brilliant Raleigh Ripper were the same person, despite all the incontrovertible evidence proving it so. Despite his reservations, he needed to meet this man and find out why and how he committed all these horrific murders, despite being such an unremarkable individual. Sitting across from Gruber in the secure interview chamber, Whittington was once again struck with how incredibly disappointing he was. Thin and wiry, with glazed-over eyes, messy hair, and a pathetic tuft of weak stubble on his chin, he looked more like Shaggy from Scooby-Doo than a cold-blooded killer. His answers to most of Dr. Whittington's questions were also insubstantial, with him often losing his train of thought, or even needing to ask the psychologist to carefully explain the question to him. Most of the time, Gruber tried to make irritating slow-motion small talk, concerning everything from the weather to movies he enjoyed. The interview had been utterly worthless. Until four hours in, Gruber mentioned something that awakened a strange memory in Dr. Whittington. He said, Hey, say doc, you remember that TV show Bobble the Clown? I loved that show as a kid. It was like my religion. Your kid ever watch it? There were a number of unsettling things about this. From the fact that for some reason Dr. Whittington could remember something about Bobble the Clown, to the fact that Kevin Gruber had no way of knowing that Dr. Whittington even had a kid. But still, he didn't let his concern show, and instead asked Gruber what he remembered about Bobble the Clown. Gruber smiled and replied, Old Bobble taught me everything I know, Doc. To which Dr. Whittington asked the million dollar question, Like what, Kevin? Gruber shrugged and just said, All kinds of stuff, Doc. Like, how to watch without being seen. How to Jimmy open a window without making a sound. How to make him hurt real bad without him dying. See, so you can even make it last longer, so it can be more fun. And of course, he taught me to get out without leaving anything behind. Well, Bobble made this all possible, Doc. And he told me all about you, too. That all this was gonna happen someday. All good things have to come to an end eventually, right? Tell the wife and kid he says hi, by the way. Dr. Whittington was astounded. Gruber seemed to stare vacantly off into space for a moment, before suddenly claiming that he had a terrible headache and he needed to go back to his cell. In any other situation, Whittington might have just written off Bobble the Clown as one of two things. A psychotic delusion or a sophisticated psychopath faking a psychotic delusion in hopes of getting the insanity plea. Like the son of Sam killer, David Berkowitz, pretending a demonic talking dog possessed by Satan made him commit all of his murders. But Whittington had heard of this Bobble the Clown before, and it wasn't in this scenario that a gas station clerk like Kevin Gruber ever would have heard of. It took half a day of research into his own archive notes to remember exactly where he'd heard it before. A child he'd interviewed almost a decade ago, who shoved gasoline and fireworks through the letterbox of an old woman's home leading to a fire that left the woman and her dog dead. When Dr. Whittington interviewed the crying child about his motives, he'd said that it wasn't his fault. 
Bobble the Clown had told them to do it on the TV. Given that there were no records of a Bobble the Clown show ever airing on any local networks, Whittington had written it off at the time as the overactive imagination of a very frightened, very disturbed young child. That same child would later go into psychiatric care before reoffending as a serial arsonist upon release. The last building he ever burned down had only one occupant, himself. Fire investigators would later state that he had just sat there, legs crossed, placidly waiting for the flames to lick his bones clean. It was becoming incredibly clear that this Bobble the Clown fantasy, if it were even a fantasy at all, seemed to be much more than an isolated phenomenon. He used his credentials to start exploring other strange crimes of passion committed by children and young adults even asking some of his friends in the criminal psychology community, off the record, if they'd ever heard of such a concept before. Frighteningly, it didn't take Dr. Whittington very long at all to hit paydirt. There was the case of the Orfeo family murders in 1985 out in Arkansas. Nine-year-old Donnie Orfeo had taken his dad's rifle out of the cabinet in the dead of night and walked room to room shooting his mother, father, and two older sisters in their beds. Neighbors had heard the gunshots and called the police. By the time they arrived at the scene, the only survivor was Donnie Orfeo himself, drenched in blood sitting in front of the TV. His hollow eyes stared zombie-like into the static. He did not resist arrest. When Donnie was taken in for questioning, his emotional responses were cold and flat. When he was asked why he murdered his family, he said that it was because his father told him he was watching too much TV. His favorite TV character, Bobble the Clown, had told him that if he murdered his family with Daddy's gun, he could watch as much TV as he liked. Just reading this, Dr. Whittington could feel sweat beating on his brow. Two cases were a coincidence, but three were a pattern. And oh, how he wished it had stopped at just three. From four days of searching, he discovered no fewer than 17 different seemingly isolated crimes with mentions of Bobble the Clown attached to the file. A five-year-old boy from New Jersey who drowned his neighbor's cat in a river with a gym bag full of heavy stones told police that he'd learned the technique from Bobble the Clown. An eight-year-old girl, arrested for tying up and torturing her sister with a rusty coat hanger in Texas, had, of course, gotten the idea from watching an episode of Bobble the Clown. Murder, assault, vandalism, torture. An extensive country-wide rap sheet all led back to that one recurring factor. They all learned it from watching Bobble the Clown. Dr. Whittington had gotten in contact with a few friends who knew people in broadcasting, while carefully omitting some of the grislier details, he implored them for any new information on whether a TV show with Bobble the Clown had ever gone out anywhere. But despite their best efforts, they didn't find any records of Bobble the Clown or any similar educational clown shows airing. Was it possibly some complex shared hallucination? Dr. Whittington simultaneously felt burdened by all this terrifying knowledge and utterly powerless to do anything useful with it. If he started blowing the whistle to the media or his superiors that a spat of horrible crimes were all being caused by a violent imaginary clown, he'd just look as deranged as any of the people he'd been studying. There seemed to be nothing he could do to stop or help any of this. He returned home that night with a heavy heart, hanging up his coat. He needed someone to talk to about all this but he couldn't burden his wife with the horrors he encountered daily on the job, much less a living nightmare like this mysterious Bobble the Clown. As he walked towards the kitchen to pour himself a stiff drink, he heard strange, jaunty music coming from the living room. He stepped back and saw his seven-year-old son, Ben, watching something on TV. As he stepped closer, he could scarcely believe his eyes. Ben, entranced, eyes fixed on a dancing, grinning, animated clown on the screen. Ben slowly turned his head towards Dr. Whittington, eyes wide and bulging, and said, I've been waiting for you to get home, Daddy. Bobble said he got tired of playing with Kevin. He wants to play with us now. Dr. Whittington turned and looked at the clown on the screen again. He could swear it was smiling right at him. That was the last thing he remembered before the sudden, intense headache and the ground standing up to embrace him. When he woke up, he was in bed with his wife, and neither of them could move. 
Thanks to the heavy ropes binding their body to the frame, Bobble is very good at teaching children to tie knots. They tried to scream, but a shiny flash of duct tape held both of their mouths closed. Dr. Whittington's eyes swiveled in his head to Ben, standing at his bedside. The boy was holding a kitchen knife, and he was very eager to show his mom and dad the fun new trick Bobble the Clown had taught him. To the SCP Foundation, this terrifying anomalous TV show is known as SCP-993, known to cause blackouts in adults and violent antisocial behavior in children. They do their best to keep the broadcasts contained. But if ever a child in your life seems to be acting strangely, perhaps ask yourself very carefully what they're watching when you're not around. Now go check out the secret at the bottom of SCP-087 Explained and Procedure 110 Montauk Revealed Fear Alone SCP-231 Tale for more harrowing tales of anomalous terror.